جزاک اللہ خیر مے گاڈ ریوارڈ یو وتھ گڈنیس سو آئی ول اسٹارٹ ود انٹروڈکشن آف دا سینٹر آف پاکستان انٹرنیشنل ریلیشن کاپیئر اٹ از اے اسٹریٹجک تھنک ٹینک ڈیڈیکیٹڈ ٹو دا اسٹڈی آف ڈیفینس سیکورٹی اینڈ اسٹریٹجک اسٹڈیز اینڈ اٹ سیکس ٹو پروموٹ این ان ڈیپتھ انالیسز آف دا نیشنل اینڈ انٹرنیشنل افیئرس اسپیشلی دا ون وچ تھرائیوز آن دا انٹرسیکشن آف پالیسی فارمولیشن اینڈ پالیسی میکنگ کوپیئر انیشیٹس اینڈ ایڈوکیٹس پالیسیز آف نیشنل ڈیولپمنٹ in order to build a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient Pakistan. Our center aims to act as a platform for the engagement of foreign and local speakers to discuss various issues and provide policy recommendations. So a brief about the webinar. Today, we are having a wide range of speakers from different countries having different professional backgrounds and vibrant experiences in the field of cybersecurity. The purpose is to have an insight into the national cybersecurity policy formulation for Pakistan. So I'll be sharing my slide. So talking about the cyberspace, uh, cyber, we should first of all define what is the cyberspace. It is a notional environment in which communication over the computer networks occur. Current technology allows the integration of number of capabilities to generate a virtual interactive experience regardless of a geographic location of the user. So the second slide B is that what are the global security challenges? First is the cyber threat to the critical infrastructure. It can disrupt a nation's political, social, and economic grounds, and it is ranked as the fifth top risk to the global world. A fragmented cyberspace and differing technological standards could hinder the economic growth, exasperate geopolitical rivalries, and further divide the societies. Vulnerable data. Information security system is a challenge for the governance and management. The data brokering market is worth $200 billion a year, and vulnerability of data can enable the manipulation of individuals and collective behavior leading to a physical and psychological harm. A new digital arm race, due to the emergence of nascent technologies, there is a revolution going on in the military and intelligence affairs, which is spiraling into a security dilemma for the nations. Monetary and fiscal risks. Finance-oriented cyber attacks can obstruct the financial and economic activity at global and international level. and it is due to the absence of proper regulatory frameworks. So national security and cyberspace. The first point is political maneuvering. It is due to the hybrid character of the cyberspace that one can attack social, cultural, economic, and military grounds. to sabotage, subvert, or destroy an adversary, or to secure the national interest. The case of US presidential hack is a relevant example here. Secondly, the information warfare. It is the ability to penetrate the societies, alter the public perception, and overturn the status quo. In this twin age, digital media acts as a potent tool for the information warfare, employed by both state and non-state actors. Third, we have economic disruption. The US, followed by European nations and then Asian economies, are the most targeted nations in terms of finance-oriented cyber attacks. Economic disruption caused by cyber attacks pose a serious threat to the national security. Then we have technologies changing strategies. As we know, the cyber offense is the new cyber defense. Network-centric warfare is currently helping militaries to lift the fog of war, to decrease the element of surprises, and adding safety for friendly units, along with the streamlining activities at command and control centers. Soft power and hard power projection. Cyberspace provides a common ground to project soft and hard power. and provide competitive advantage to an actor for increasing the national security. 
There are a number of cases of the cyber espionage, attacks on the critical information structures and data breaches, which hint toward a change in the military and intelligence strategies and underlying cyberspace as the enabler and the force multiplier. In case of Pakistan, we are facing an attack from the eastern border where the India had led the cyber, cyber security dilemma for the Pakistan by establishing the defense certs, the army cyber security establishment and announced to establish a cyber command very soon. Similarly, India's defense partnership with US and Israel, there's a possibility that the country would acquire the offensive capabilities in the realm of cyberspace. Recently, in August, ISPR reported that an alleged smartphone spying of high-level military officers of Pakistan by the India, and it hinted toward the possibility of cyber offense from India. So what are the key takeaways of the last webinar that Copier organized? First of all, to identify the critical infrastructures and formulate a relative benchmark for the cybersecurity strategy to develop a strategy for the national cyberspace and create cyber awareness. Thirdly, cybersecurity is a global challenge and it requires a global solidarity to overcome this menace. So what is the rationale of to our today's conference? It is the advocacy for the formulation of a comprehensive national cybersecurity for the Pakistan. So keeping this in mind, Let's start today's session. So our first speaker today is Mr. Amar Jaffrey, who is the former additional DG FIA and a distinguished member of the Prime Minister's Task Force on Cybersecurity. Amar Jaffrey brings a rich experience in public and private sector, and currently he is leading two initiatives, namely Digital Pakistan and Cybersecure Pakistan. Mr. Amar Jaffrey is a staunch advocate of the cyber safety and cybersecurity and played a vital role in the development of Pakistan cyber laws. Today, his topic of speech will be cyberspace, the new war front. A very warm welcome, Mr. Jaffrey. Please unmute your mic, sir. Thank you. Am I audible? I am audible? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. loud and clear. A respected Ramna Malik. Uh, Mr. Vaz, you have set the pitch and tone of today's conference, trust me. I am always very happy when I see a young and dynamic person talking on these issues. Thank you very much for setting the base for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, can can uh, you share my presentation? Okay, tell is set the presentation. Let me tell you all of you about briefly about myself. My name is Amar Jaffrey. I will all, all, always be induced by Mr. Ovas. I won't go into detail. Uh, currently, uh, I feel that there's a genuine need for triggering these dialogues we are talking about. Today, we are talking about a domain which is very well discussed in most part of the world. Today, gentlemen, let's not forget that the advanced countries invented all these things for their own defense, for their own their strategies. We are the recipient of all these advancements. We have yet to think upon it, ponder upon it very seriously, that to what advent, advantage we can use them, to what advantage we should understand them. Next, please. Next, please. I have already talked about myself. So next, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. We had the internet, we are having internet, and very soon we'll be having internet internet totally different from the internet of today. I will try to, I will try to uh, make my humble effort to let all of you know 
that what's going to happen in next two to three years. So unless we will not start learning about today's driving force, which is the internet, I think it won't be available. Uh, I, uh, 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 the recent advancement won't be available to us. So the let everybody know about the past and present of internet. I'll talk about the future of internet. I think the of the presentation let it work. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We're trying to do it again. Um, tab tak you can. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. Okay. Is it okay. is it visible? Uh, no, no, not not now. Now it's yes. visible. Okay. Okay. Now next please. Thanks. Yeah, next please. Uh, no, yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, you know, no, the, 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 the yes, uh, slide before it. Okay, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, the future of uh, internet would drive, will be driven by few things like artificial intelligence, like blockchain, like uh, internet of things and all these things. I think all these emerging technologies would have three impacts. And we have to think about three impacts today. First is the economic impact. Second is the uh, society effect on society. And third is the effect on defense. I think today's uh, seminar is focused towards the defense of Pakistan in the new era of uh, cyber warfare. Next, please. OK. Brusher is the, uh, I think, in top three uh, expert in uh, cyber related issues. He was in Islamabad, uh, I think, uh, 10 years before. He was a guest of FIE NR3C. So I asked him a question that what is the best cyber security? 10 years before, he said, two inch of air, don't connect. Same thing applies today. If we want to be totally secure, don't connect. So let's think together today that can we afford without internet? You may have your thoughts. My feeling is that today internet is like water. It's like air to us. If we won't have internet, I think we'll be in serious trouble. So we have to continue with internet. We have to make our internet secure. And we have to strategize what we want from this internet. Next, please. Okay. Uh, you know, if we think about 15 years before or 20 years before, or even 10 years before, our software was not designed for security. Our networks were not designed for security. We had the typical uh, several layers in which we used to think about SSL and all these things. I think today, Today, it should be in the foreground. Why? Let's take the example of DNS. You know, DNS security has become of paramount interest because once I click something, it hops on different locations, then it reaches somewhere. Now, whatever we had between th uh, third layer and fourth layer, and then we had SSL and all these things, we have to apply it now. Uh, they, they all know, they all know that uh, we are using HTTPSS and we are using SSL, they all know. Hackers are much advanced than us. Today, we'll have to think about DNS security. We have to work on every hop of DNS. Next, please. Okay. I think today, cybersecurity should be in the design of everything. Like when you try to conceive your own house, what do you think about it? where I would sleep, where I would read, where I will sit, where I will in the sunshine. It, it, it never happens as, never happens that, like this, that you build a house, then you start about your comforts and your work. No, no, it, it must be in your design. So anything we, we, uh, we, we think today, be it education, be it health. You know, normally we say, what is the need for uh, cybersecurity in health? Trust you me, only today I was giving a talk in a webinar in, in Bangladesh, that is the, of highest priority, highest priority. Because if somebody wants 
that uh, for example i i am i am doing a contract with someone and somebody want that uh, it this should be delayed i think he should just uh, hack into my health system and he will know that where i am going would would i be alive after 6 month or not thing like this so why hipala came in us 20 20 25 years ago only due to this these things so whatever you are thinking are you thinking education system your uh, drones your even education system anything you are thinking cyber security must be in the design of that scheme of things next please okay you know very on a very later side actually corona solved my number of problems a lot of people hearing to me i i was i was just uh, shouting on the top of the roof that we should do this 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 so suddenly in two months time everything went online i think corona although we have some uh, sad stories about corona also we have lost number of uh, uh, lives in corona but i'm talking about the opportunity point of view it is the fastest digital transformation opportunity you know let me tell you something historical when we had the first week of corona it's a record i went to three offices of this country and said please make internet available to every part of pakistan and make it free and rehan ala wala was with me in this initiative why i said give uh, smartphones to everyone now even today we should think about these things yes i understand that that there is a repercussion for all these issues also but today we cannot think of digital transformation unless we do not think of the cyber security it is the lifeline of digital transformation including me amna so many people we are all talking about digital pakistan how it is possible that we have a digital pakistan without cyber security so cyber security must be in the foreground of digital pakistan next please okay now we had internet we are having internet and the future of internet would depend on emerging technologies so we have to think today even right now today in every house average house we are having six or seven devices on an average which are transmitting data but this transmission of data would escalate to 100 times more in next 2 to 3 years of time we have air conditions uh, linked with iot's we have uh, refrigerators we have our television uh, we have our internet connections everywhere we are we are in the domain of wifi even in gsm there are a lot of issues so now we have to think in terms of cyber security in the era of emerging technologies let me give you one example i'll talk about it in next slides industrial revolution we are all talking about industrial revolution think about a minute i have a factory working normally and suddenly at 4 am in the morning when there is less staff every, everything goes down and nobody knows what has happened look at the mindset of the owner of that factory only i think 3 uh, 4 uh, weeks before i was in karachi before in the fpc had quarter everybody was sitting there i told them if you do not adopt ir today our factory will stop closing after 2 to 3 years at the same time i said going to ir is not a big issue it's a matter of money and some training also but securing the ir is the biggest challenge so these are all challenges of cyber security in emerging technologies and we have to ponder very seriously about it think about think about it next please okay i think this is the biggest game changer let me repeat again only today i requested amna malik to have exclusive seminar on this so that we can talk hours and hours on this our 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 new generation needs to listen to all these things this is the i think real game changer and when we say real game changer defense and our economics is not a exception to it it will definitely affect the defense if we will not understand the real implication of artificial intelligence in our defense strategies i think we are doing something wrong very seriously we have to think about artificial intelligence machine writing code for machine 
very recently there there has been a study i think uh, some co some code uh, machine learning code went wrong and the uh, google and amazon talking to each other and nobody knows what they're talking about so this is something there there's, there's there's a myth behind it there's a there's an argument and they have uh, some solid points also that we should not invest into artificial intelligence because it's going to create more problems than solving the problems but i think you can't stop time and technology artificial intelligence is going to impede everything we are talking about today everything we are talking about today i think today we should talk about use of artificial intelligence for cyber security there are two ways of securing something once you wait for some attack and second is that you anticipate the attack now the attack patterns are there now uh, the hackers will not enter your system and steal something no 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 they will come and they will see what you are doing first they will not touch anything then they will wait for some appropriate time be it a fintech system be it a defense system be it anything and everybody will choose the appropriate time at the time of his own interest and where have to they have to strike next please okay as i told you that the industrial revolution 4.0 we passed through 1.0 2.0 only today there was an argument i was i was doing with some gentleman he said the industrial revolution 4.0 will make lot of people jobless i said the same argument was given 70 years before nobody lost his job so industrial revolution is creating new jobs our dilemma is that we do not understand that what will be what would be those new jobs industrial revolution 4.0 recently our prime minister talked about the industrial revolution 5.0 yes i am very happy but we were very good in 2.0 but we totally skipped 3.0 and now we are talking about 4.0 but the good news is that there is a bridge available and we can again i request uh, madam amna malik to have a, a specialized program on this we'll talk about in detail now from 3.2.0 uh, we can still go, go to 4.0 so uh recently i was in selcourt and i talked to the chamber to the university that we should train our students into industrial revolution 4.0 but at the same time it is dependent on defense of ir cyber defense unless we will not think about it think for a, think for a minute just think for a minute i have a factory that is dependent on some piece of uh, technology right somebody hacks it it has to give me alarm for something and that hacking does not allow that alarm what is going to happen the entire thing is going to um, destroy so it, these are buzzwords we are all talking about it but at the same time as i said in the in the start it should be in the design of everything and here i would like to stress that please we should think about our own indigenous, indigenous technologies we should talk about open source we should talk about all these things next please right iot's we started from things of internet i am a old timer computer person there was a modem there was a monitor there was a keyboard so from things of internet today we are talking of internet of things because that has escalated to such a big amount that we even can't count it today so iot's again are game changers in every technology in everything we are talking about iot's now we are talking about iiot's industrial iot's so now our education depend on iot our health system are depend on iot's but at the same time just think for a minute iot in our home is creating a threat for us also in our office in our everything and very painfully i must discuss with you that uh, uh, we are not talking about the platform of iot's the regulations for iot's the governance rules for iot's the policy for iot's the strategy for iot's everybody is bringing stuff of iot's in pakistan in in the bags commercial bags but nobody is talking nobody is thinking the device you have in your home in your computer uh, what uh, what what it is doing it is doing something for for you doing something for somebody else so these are issues 
uh, internet of things are uh, we again i said um, just don't pay attention to what threats are just pay attention to how we should mitigate it you know uh, there's a old slang that uh, uh, why why we need doors in the world of windows so i think we should think big about it we have to live with it we have to take along with this next please i'm i feel i'm short of time so i have to be quick okay blockchain for cyber security you know again i must say in at the cost of repeating that blockchain is not a use case of internet like we have web we have social media blah 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 this is the fundamental of internet hey gentlemen i am working on it for the last 5 years initially we took and linked blockchain with cryptocurrencies and people were discouraged not to invest into cyber into blockchain but yes it was started through cryptocurrencies mr sushi had the idea of cryptocurrency through blockchain but the blockchain technology has emerged to a certain level that now we cannot afford to uh, ignore it i think all uh, latest advancements are based on the blockchain uh, issues but it is a solution to the cyber threat also again i have a limited time so i won't go into more detail of blockchain uh, the use of blockchain in cyber security but let me tell you again oh next slide very good dark side of internet you know the day that the, the uh, humans thought about advancements even in the um, uh, in in the dark era there was a there was a dark side of every every development just think for a minute the street lights of london are the part of the first industrial revolution you know the word constable is the part of, the, the word constable is the part of industrial revolution that's why in uk they call it chief constable so if with every advancement we have a dark side criminals are always much ahead of the normal man because they have to work on two sides one is to secure themselves to save them some from the law enforcement and once and second is to uh, to 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 uh, to deprive the people of their hard earnings so the dark side of internet is there the i think uh, daily we see lot of incidents that somebody lost this somebody lost this and there's a war going on between the cyber criminals and the normal people so again is a trade off either you don't connect you just sit in your home do nothing or so the the call of the time is that we should be educated enough to handle the people working on the dark side of internet next please next please yes cyber warfare i think uh, Uh, I, I i personally feel that uh, there will be hardly any uh, uh, foot soldiers now uh, there there'll be a uh, hybrid wars there be cyber wars uh, and uh, the old slang bites before bullets that was in the georgia war actually first they in- incapacitated the system then they entered into the country so cyber war is there hybrid cyber war already started we are we are observing it uh, from number of uh, uh, recent incidents and uh, we must be uh, we must be in the knowledge that uh, our military cannot do everything itself we have to go hand in hand with our uh, defense forces because cyber warfare is something linked with the society also just think about the rumors era when we had rumors but now let let me tell you a historical fact the fall of trafalgar square london the news went canada in 3 years and i now in 3 seconds everything is everywhere in the world so from 3 years we have come down to the level of 3 seconds at times i i am afraid and i would like to share it with you there are there are some technologies which create holograms in the air we are muslims we believe in so many things so at times i fear that we have holograms in the air and there is some sound and all these things and uh, we have been listening uh, since uh, our birth so i am afraid of these things so we should be very much prepared about hybrid cyber uh, hybrid uh, cyber wars and uh, we should work together with our defense forces next please okay 
Uh, I've talked about it. I won't go into detail. It's a fuel for cyber warfare. And now I think uh, we have to understand that our enemies are studying every click you make on the internet. Let me tell you. The field of data sizes has reached to a level that somebody can anticipate my actions now. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Just, just see your uh, analysis on different websites about you. You know, on, on a lighter side, uh, we are talking very, very serious. If wife does not uh, like your uh, Facebook post, <laughs> they, are, they have some trouble, and vice versa also. So uh, they are, uh, uh, it is all based on artificial intelligence. It is not a human selection of things. Uh, our, our word, please be very careful when you use the uh, very strong word, words against somebody on the social media because these words are being selected. They are put into some box and AI and identified patterns about your personality. And then you are gauged. To my understanding, after uh, three to five years, you will be graded on based on your performance on the internet. Next, please. Uh, I think there are a lot of tools, techniques available to process big data. We are generating big data everywhere in our life, everywhere in our life. Uh, Amna, can you tell me the time I have at my disposal? I think time to hold it, but you can continue one, two minutes more. Okay, fine, fine. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. I like to go. Next, please. Okay, uh, deep fake and fake media, all of these things are creating a lot of troubles. Um, uh, Mr. X will be hearing something from Mr. Y against him, or you can, you can find a prime minister of a country uh, praising the opposition leader, and that, would be, that, that will be fake. That will be fake media. Uh, even the dialect will be there. Even the, uh, the words will be there. And voice will be definitely similar there. So it's a big, we should be careful. And that will be used as a weapon in cyber warfare. Next, please. Yes, we have to reinvent our diplomacy. Our traditional diplomatic channels, we have to think about it. Because in cyber warfare, our, diplo our the foreign office has to, and I'm very happy, I'm working with foreign office in something, and they are, they are working on that. But everything has to be reinvented. Next, please. Next, please. Yes, uh, very finally. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, we have to handle the cyber conflicts and safeguard our strategic interest uh, collectively. Collective. Next, please. We have to standardize everything in our cyber world because unless we do not conform to the international standards, we are not living in an island. We are living in a country where a lot of countries are surrounded by us. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, my final, yes. Uh, need for common criteria. We should be ahead of tide instead of behind of tide if we want to remain aligned with the digital transformation. Next, please. I thank you, Amna, and your entire team for giving me the opportunity. And uh, maybe in the end of the today's, I'll be available for any question answer. Thank you, Amna. Thank you um, much. I have, I have just one question, and then we move to our worthy speaker. Uh, Amar, sir, you are the part of cybersecurity, uh, President Cybersecurity uh, Committee. So can you a li little bit elaborate uh, uh, various development in the cybersecurity sector uh, in the uh, national level at the defense level because you know about all the development going on? Okay. Uh, it took us a long time to understand the difference between cyber crime and cyber security. We had been making laws, we have been making efforts against cyber criminals. That's fine. But cyber security is a different domain, and I'm very happy that the present government has taken it very seriously, and the task force now working on that. And I'm very happy that my friend Farooq is here from Canada. He will tell a lot of things what's happening in Canada. But we are learning, we are learning fast from international best practice. I think this committee is going very fine. Uh, we are we are we are working in different uh, domains. We are working in different subcommittees, and I think in next one month's time there will be a. The, you know this is very important that we should have a consensus. Cyber security is the responsibility of everyone in this country. It is not the responsibility of the government of Pakistan only. It is the responsibility of universities about 
civil society, about technology companies, about media. So I am very happy that in uh, different communities we are working on that. Uh, we have a very strong group of uh, Cyber Security Alliance of Pakistan. I am very happy that people are, I think uh, uh, our, uh, four members are in, in that committee and I'm very happy that they are working together. We get wisdom from our group of 500 people. Uh, Farooq is in, also in that group and that wisdom we, we join it together and then we go to the committee and we talk about it. And I'm very ha happy and very excited to uh, to inform you. It's a very serious effort. And I, I must bring on, uh, bring, on, bring on record. President of Pakistan is very well aware of all these issues. Really, I'm so excited when I listen to him. I, I never thought about it, that the person of his stature will, will understand uh, these uh, delicate matters so deeply. So I think uh, uh, we are working in different domains, in different directions, and in, uh, I think, the next few weeks of time, we'll be consolidating, and then it will go to the cabinet, and then from there, it will go to the uh, assembly. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Amar Sahib. I think, Wes, let's move to Farooq Nayyar Sahib. Uh, he's yeah. Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to our next speaker, Mr. Farooq Nayyar. He is the Chief Information Security Officer at Orion, the largest net research and education network of Canada. He has the portfolio of being the lead for the Ontario Cybersecurity Higher Education Consortium. Uh, Mr. Farooq brings a rich experience of more than 18 years in the cybersecurity. Uh, he is the recipient of EC Council's Presidential Award in 2019 and CSO Compass Award in 2010. Uh, he currently serves as the Board of Advisors for the Cyber-Related Councils in Canada, and he is also on the Program Advisory Board for the Masters in Cybersecurity and Threat Intelligence Program at University of Gulab and Chair of the Technical Advisory Committee at Hal Hub Durham College in Canada. So Mr. Farooq will talk about the importance of cyber threat intelligence and countering cyber threats. Uh, a very warm welcome, Mr. Farooq. Thank you, Jeep. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, just doing a sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the management of Copair, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Amna Malik Vestiki, uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, at this uh, really interesting uh, webinar. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Amar Jafi Saab for making the introduction. I also see uh, Ambassador Khalid Mahmoud Saab over here had the uh, pleasure of uh, speaking at one of the events that he spoke at and uh, really honored to be amongst a gathering of esteemed uh, cybersecurity speakers for today. I shall be sharing my screen, so just bear with me. Um, Can everybody see my screen now? Mm, yes, it's visible. Okay, so the topic for today uh, that I shall be talking about is importance of cyber threat intelligence in countering cyber threats. So before I start, in fact, uh, Uves, thanks for the kind introduction. So I'll probably skip this uh, slide. Uh, I'm working on a number of initiatives in Canada and uh, working with uh, with some institutions in Pakistan too. I was recently elected as the chair for the Committee on Innovation and Emerging Technologies as part of Canada Pakistan Research and Development Council, which serves under the uh, oversight of the Consulate of Pakistan in, in Toronto and working really closely on that. So anyways, I'll skip this, but uh, I shall start uh, my, my session for today by first of all acknowledging that uh, both Oasis and Amar Saab have set the stage uh, in terms of the importance of cybersecurity, the importance of uh, countering uh, cyber threats in the best way possible. We need to have a national approach. We need to make sure that we have all the right stakeholders involved. But now uh, I'm going to be talking about something which is the backbone of cyber uh, security or cyber uh, threat response. I'd like to start off by a famous saying from this book called The Art of War. And I recommend that everybody should read this book at some point in time. I've learned a lot, for, a lot from this book, uh, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And in this book, there's a famous quote which says that, know thyself, know thy enemy, a hundred battles and a hundred victories. So if you know yourself, and if you know an, your enemy, you can win almost every battle against your enemy. And remember that battles, always, be it 500 years ago, be it 300 years ago, be it 1,000 years ago, was 
always one based on information or intelligence and that intelligence led to how you're going to be attacking uh, your enemy from the offensive perspective or from the defensive perspective i mean the reason why the chinese are so successful today is they know about all the adversaries they know about all the friends and that's how they have become a superpower in the world right now okay let's move forward so let's talk about the concept of cyber threat intelligence and why did i actually choose this topic so i think the word threat intelligence is known to everybody uh, who is present over here i think we all know that what role does uh, threat intel play uh, in uh, in normal uh, activities in the day of peace in the day of uh, war and when we talk about cyber warfare which is an ongoing thing right now threat intelligence is a very important piece so when you talk about the concept of threat intelligence threat intelligence in short is evidence based knowledge which includes context mechanisms indicators implications actionable advice about an existing uh, threat or menace or hazards to assets that can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to the menace or uh, or hazard so basically having enough information about an existing threat or about a threat which is about to materialize now usually when we talk about a cyber threat intelligence and particularly from the aspect of cyber security itself there is a certain level of expectation from cyber threat intelligence and the first thing is that you need to understand the threat landscape from a dynamic and strategic perspective it, and from that perspective it helps an organization or a government to prepare for and react appropriately to cyber events and at times it helps you in preventing a cyber threat or perhaps responding to it when we talk about cyber threat intelligence there are at least four categories of cyber threat intelligence that we usually talk about so if you look at the figure on my on the left side of my screen uh, you'll see that on the left side of the upper quadrant you'll see strategic threat intelligence which is more high level information uh, more uh, about the changing risk to the board or to the government so basically if you're talking from the government perspective uh, the prime minister of the country the president of the country or the chief of army staff is it should be getting a strategic cyber threat intelligence report on a regular basis so this is more for the executive management of an organization or of the machinery of the government then you go to the second level uh which is more about tactical so this is like for a mid tier management so attacker methodologies and tactics and the consumer of this kind of cyber threat intelligence are architects admins security managers departmental managers they should have this so this is the upper part of this uh, whole uh, pie if you go to the lower quadrants you'll see that there's operational threat intelligence also which has details of incoming attacks okay it has that information and then you go into the nitty gritties which is technical threat intelligence which is indicators of specific malware indicators of compromise more information about malicious ip addresses and all that information so you'll see that the more high you go up in this whole uh, pie chart you're talking more of uh, more strategic and more high level stuff the more uh, down you go on this pie chart you're talking more about technical and more low level stuff but cyber threat intelligence at every level is important and is consumed can be consumed by various levels of government and various levels of organizational stakeholders moving forward so when we talk about threats and then we talk about threat actors we are talking about at least four to five categories so i would like to start off by state sponsored uh threat actors because that is something which is more prevalent uh, when we talk about tensions in south asia or uh, how pakistan is positioned so state sponsored activities are more categorized within the uh, within the avenue of apt or advanced persistent threat style attacks and they are usually custom malware uh and exploits and they are usually the the, the most common attack vector or deployment uh, tool which is used is phishing for this and these are things which are used to disrupt activities at a critical infrastructure uh, level as always mentioned already and these are activities which could disrupt operations this could uh, disrupt activities this could be used for eavesdropping any sensitive communication so back in august when there was uh, an uh, an activity originated by one of the neighboring countries of Pakistan in which they tried to eavesdrop on whatsapp communications of 
some critical or important uh, individuals within the Pakistani government. That was something which was a typical state-sponsored activity in which they were eavesdropping on important information. So these people don't do small time things. They would go after important pieces of information or disrupting operations. And they don't do, they don't do things like ransomware or they don't, we won't ask you for like 10 or 15 bitcoins. But these are things which are, are really important and not just for Pakistan, but for Western, uh, uh, democracies or Western countries too. Like uh, just last night, we heard news about uh, FBI breaking a news saying that India, I'm sorry, Iran and Russia now have access to the voters list in the US. So now there is speculation about intervention of Iran and Russia uh, in the American election. So just imagine how state sponsored activities can disrupt ongoing activities. The other uh, thing that I want to talk about is hacktivists. So these are uh, hacktivists who are people who have an agenda. At times they're work working as mercenaries too, or working on the agenda of governments too. And they're more into cyber vandalism or they're also into uh, deploying various kinds of malware or ransomware. Uh, I mean, if you recall that there were two major incidents which are making headlines throughout the world right now. Or uh, one is the Emotet gang, which is a, an organized cyber criminal gang uh, based out of Europe, which is now offering uh, malware or ransomware for hire, and they are now reaching out to various uh, countries and deploying their malware in some shape or form. Most of their attachments are actually Office 365 based files, and through that they are downloading uh, malware into uh, their victims uh, endpoints. Apart from that, organized criminal gangs are also there who are uh, uh, working for, uh, uh, close to this agenda. In fact, uh, Emotet, which I just spoke about, is more on organized criminals, whereas hacktivists are groups like uh, Anonymous who have an agenda and who are actually going after governments. The other one, which is also should never be uh, ignored, is insider threat. Uh, uh, insider threat is basically divided into two categories. One is unintentional error, or at times it's an intentional error or somebody within an organization has malicious intent. Uh, if you look at the recent trends in terms of cyber threats, you will notice that most of these uh, threat actors uh, can, are either state sponsored and in some cases they are inside the threats also. So make sure that you guys are on the lookout for such things. Okay, so here was the description of the threat actors moving forward. I uh, just wanted to shed some light on a cyber kill chain. So whenever we talk about a cyber threat materializing, uh, we often talk about the whole kill chain. How does this whole cyber threat initiate and how is it deployed and how does it um, achieve its objectives? So I think the first thing is reconnaissance. Um, and I think this is something which uh, most of the people who come from a military background or intelligence background would be able to relate to this. I mean, even in regular warfare, not just cyber warfare, these activities or these steps are prevalent. So the first thing is reconnaissance. So most of these uh, threat actors and would, would fall in those four categories, which I just mentioned, would do reconnaissance and active reconnaissance just to see that, okay, how does their victim behave? What are the back doors of the victim? Okay, things like those. Then the second thing is that once they know enough about the victim, they will weaponize, uh, configure the malware, and then they package it. And the third thing is delivery. In most of the cases, the most common delivery mechanism or attack vector is phishing. Uh, then it's uh, exploitation. So once the malware is delivered, uh, that particular malware or ransomware uh, is exploited through technical means uh, or human means, and then various applications are infected. And then it goes to the next level, which is installation uh, and change of characteristics. And then communication uh, begins between victim and adversary. And then it leads to uh, escalation of privileges and lateral movement. And then the particular threat actor is able to achieve their objectives. There are various examples of that. I think starting from ransomware, uh, which is usually deployed through phishing um, uh, mechanism. Once it's deployed, it, uh, it crypto locks the files and then the victim has to pay a ransom against it. The same thing applies to malware in which a malware when it installs on the victim's endpoint, it's, uh, it probably uh, infects some applications or the operating system due to which it disrupts operations or the way the, that endpoint is operating. So this is just a brief description of uh, the kill chain. I just want to do a time check. How are we doing in terms of time right now? You have time. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'll move on to the next uh, slide now. So, like to bring everybody's attention towards uh, some current challenges. 
So as it relates to threat intelligence, uh, at times the term threat intelligence or we uh, goes by the acronym TI is poorly understood. At times people think that threat intelligence is, threat, is just threat feeds that you're getting into your firewall or into your uh, security information event managed bool or your sec uh, tool or your security operations center. It's much more than that. And that's why towards the onset of today's session, I spoke about the four categories of threat intelligence, strategic, operational, technical, and tactical. The second challenge that is often faced by organizations is immature partial implementation. So at times organizations will go for uh, implementing a threat intelligence framework or tool, but the whole implementation is not uh, mature enough. And that's why they're not able to reap the complete benefits of threat intelligence. The third one is more about the application of threat intelligence uh, in, in sense because threat intelligence though can be automated but needs a lot of human input, making sure that you're able to get rid of the noise and make sure that you're able to segregate the noise from the actual pieces of information. Uh, and we are, uh, and so therefore automated threat intelligence, though it's there, it still needs to mature to a certain degree. Uh, the next one is security is often viewed as an overhead. So all initiatives need to have KPIs and show value. And one thing which I can tell you right now, and I think uh, Amar Saab also highlighted that, is cybersecurity uh, is something which is not tangible. Investment in cybersecurity is not something tangible. You won't feel the importance of cybersecurity unless you are hit by a cybersecurity incident. If you all recall the ransomware incident at K-Electric a few weeks ago, well, if K-Electric wasn't hit with the ransomware, none of the critical infrastructures in Pakistan would be thinking that they could be hit by ransomware someday. The same thing applies to the Western part of the world. I mean, Canada and US have experienced numerous, numerous cybersecurity incidents, which triggered lots of activities. So usually the approach towards cybersecurity is reactive and not proactive. So that's how we go. Uh, the other thing uh, which I, I mentioned initially was uh, noise and reaction required. So make sure that you're able to segregate the noise from the actual threat information so that you can focus on those things. So these are some of the uh, current challenges that I wanted to talk about. Uh, moving forward, uh, there are lots of examples of uh, threat intelligence. Uh, I mean, uh, and I won't go into the details. There are open source uh, tools which you can use. You can use information sharing platforms like having certs or sectoral uh, certs or uh, ISACs, which can uh, be used for circulating information. In the US and Canada, we've got the concept of ISACs, which is information sharing and analysis center. Apart from that, organization specific threat intelligence is more around uh, information about the organization, information which is there on social media, information that is there on talk web. and uh, and phishing campaigns which are conducted against your organization. So we have various types of uh, uh, information and intelligence fields which can be leveraged by an organization. But these are just some examples of that. I just want to be cognizant of time, so I don't want to go into details over here. Uh, moving forward, uh, I want to spend more time on this slide because uh, we need to understand the key importance of threat intelligence and why does it matter? And these are things which will resonate with the key stakeholders in Pakistan. So the first thing is that threat intelligence helps you in lowering costs. So the thing is that cyber threat intelligence can lower your overall expenses and save your business and the government expenses uh, because improved defense helps in mitigating an organization's risk in the aftermath of a data breach and the organization not only suffers data loss, but it also has to bear with many costs like post-incident remediation, restoration, fines, and lawsuits. You've got Gibran Elias on the call. He'll probably talk about the cost of en engaging breach response and incident response. So if you have good threat intelligence, well, guess what? You might be able to avoid a cybersecurity incident, and that would help in reducing your cost. The second thing that I want to talk about is threat intelligence helps you in, in lowering risks. So if you have threat intelligence, <clears throat> it would help you in responding to threats in a more timely manner or preventing cyber threat events. And in that case, it helps you to reduce your cybersecurity risks. A third one, which is really, really important, is that if you have threat intelligence, it's going to help you prevent a cyber threat uh, event, and that, that could lead to avoiding loss of data. The, the next thing which I want to talk about is something which also Amar Saab alluded to, was, is more about maximizing staffing. So bringing in threat intelligence 
does not create uh, job insecurities, but uh, in fact, it boosts uh, opportunities for having more staffs. So once you have uh, threat intelligence, you can have a full security operations team, instant response team, uh, security leadership team. So it enables you to hire more people with the required skill set. The next one is more uh, in terms of uh, countering cyber warfare, which is more around in-depth cyber intelligence analysis. So <clears throat> with cyber threat intelligence, you'll be able to gather in-depth cyber intelligence, which will be able, which will enable governments and organizations to respond to cyber threats uh, and get, have more in-depth information about the adversary, just like it was said in the Art of the War book. Other one is threat intelligence sharing. We In the West, we often say that uh, cybersecurity is a team sport and threat intelligence should be shared amongst all stakeholders. <clears throat> Amarsab over the past few years has worked a lot in forming alliances with certs in uh, Far East Asia and uh, Asia like the certs in Turkey, Oman and Malaysia and all that, that would really help uh, us in fostering uh, a cert model. Now moving towards the end of today's session, I think in terms of next steps, I think what organizations and stakeholders need to do is that they need to make sure that they inform stakeholders uh, and make sure that they have the right skill sets in the organizations. So making sure that organizations and governments are investing more in people, process and technology and not technology alone. Make sure that all the stakeholders are involved. Uh, they learn from uh, <clears throat> the past experiences and past security incidents and make sure that the expectations are set right. Uh, we need to have a national approach, not just in Pakistan, but globally. We need to have a sector-based approach. We need to have as much automation as possible. And we need to also have orchestration uh, as much as we can. And making sure that we get it right. If we are able to defend ourselves, we'll, we'll, we'll do a really good job of that. Uh, so using cyber threat intelligence to your advantage could help prevent big cybersecurity fiascos. So with that, I would like to end my session today. And thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Faru. Uh, you mentioned in the challenges part that TI is threat intelligence is probably uh, poorly understood. So, uh, and we know that the, in the cybersecurity realm, uh, the private side. sector you know, dominates the public sector. So what should of Pakistan to know to have a better understanding of the threat intelligence? So I think I couldn't get your question. So are you talking about what needs to be done in Pakistan for better threat intelligence? Yeah. Yeah. By by <clears throat> by private sector. So I think we need to have better public private partnerships in Pakistan. We need to have uh, a, a whole a holistic approach in Pakistan in which the private and public sector work together. Uh, I mean, I can give you the example of Canada. I mean, we have the Canadian Center of Cybersecurity in which we have stakeholders from the public service, from the military, from the private sector, and we all working together to make sure that we help each other out with the skill sets that we have. Right. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, I guess so government or public sector should facilitate. Yeah, ma'am, go ahead. Your question. Sorry. Uh, uh, my question is... Uh, 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 former advisor uh, NSA, uh, General Janjuwal, he mentioned that uh, and he suggested that there should be an e council for this threat intelligence and to counter this threat intelligence. They should develop an e council of cybersecurity. So, what do you think? Uh, uh, why we are unable to make it so that uh, at the government level we are able to take certain measures and how the Canadian government is working in this regard? So the Canadian, uh, so at the national level in Canada, we have the Canadian Center of Cybersecurity, uh, which was an initiative which was initially led by the Ministry of Public Safety, which is our Ministry of Interior. But Alham Alhamdulillah, we have been able to uh, mature that model. So we now have three ministries overseeing that. Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Innovation, and Ministry of Public Safety. I think we need to have a similar approach in Pakistan in which we have a directorate of cybersecurity, which is overseen not just by one ministry, but by multiple ministries. Uh, I mean, uh, and, I, and there are similar success stories in EU, in the Middle East, 
in Malaysia and in Canada that is that have been successful. So having a holistic approach and having all the stakeholders involved will be a better approach. We need to make sure that we also have the military involved, the, all the key uh, uh, regulators involved to make sure that they are contributing towards a success for this. This cannot be done alone by the public sector, cannot be done alone by the military. Thank you very much, Mr. Farooq. So, uh, so the takeaway message is that we should establish uh, a directorate of the cybersecurity, which should, you know, comprise of all the stakeholders. Yeah. So moving on towards our next speaker, we have Dr. Aftab Rizbi with us. He's the CEO of the Risk Associates. He's an internationally renowned information security consultant and an entrepreneur with more than 25 years of experience. Uh, he has been involved in the compliance of the e-commerce industry since establishment and is considered as one of the world's leaders in information security audits and compliance services. Uh, his areas of expertise are technology, risk mitigation, and cyber safety. Uh, today, Mr. D Dr. Rizri will shed light on the subject of cyber security and challenges to the human security. Uh, Dr. Rizri. Thanks, thanks, Ovest. Thanks for the nice introduction, and thank you, uh, Amna, for organizing such a wonderful evening. Even though it's a morning in Australia, it's at 2 a.m., but uh, I'm so keen to, to join this. Right, so um, I'm sure I'm allowed to screen share. Yeah, I'm sure you can screen. share it. Right, thanks uh, again. Thank you very much for organizing this. It's very timely and very important. As uh, Amar Saab already said, that we need to discuss all of these issues. And uh, one thing I was very glad to see, and again, I would congratulate the team who has organized this, that they're trying to cover the whole aspects of, all aspects of uh, cybersecurity. And the title, which is, you know, the, the topic which was given to me by the team was human security, challenges to human security with cybersecurity. Initially, when we think about these things and you know, being, being a, a working so much in cybersecurity, we always feel that, you know, that now we are, there are problems, there is ransomware, there is an issue with the people don't understand, there is a problem with the password security and so on, so on, so on. When I tried to look into this, and again, uh, the only reason I looked into it more detail, because I was asked to speak about it, then I thought that it is a very, it, it is a very important topic, not only that it is an important topic where humans are involved, but it's very deep, and there's so many effects, so many impact, which we need to consider at the national level. So we have the challenge that how do we treat this problem? And I'm always amazed when I look at something by great people and whenever, it doesn't matter what time they say, it is valid for every time. So where is a dangerous place to live? Not because of people who are evil, but because of the people who don't know, don't do anything about it. So this will be, who will be in that category? That people who don't know is of a lesser problem as opposed to those people who don't do anything. And obviously the other, the other actors which are there to clear these problems, to uh, exploit these issues will always be there. So I think that our role is very important, not only important, but it is essential for us to act, do something. And again, um, Jafri Saab and some other people I can see over here, even Farooq and everyone, we're just talking about it forever since 2004, 2005, when there was no understanding of cyber, it was only IT security we're talking about. So uh, what is national security? Everyone knows about it. It is just, uh, just to put, in the con put the things in the context. We're talking of the nation as a whole. When, I would, when we talk about the national security, um, um, we, we're not here to make some jokes about national security, which obviously that if you don't want to tell anything, it's national security, which happens everywhere in the politics. But what we are talking about here is that we're talking of the nation as a whole. We are talking of the external dangers. We're talking of the, the, the problems which can have 
which the nation can have from the geographical boundaries as well as from its, its people perspective. So this is what we think from the national security. But when we talk about the human security, then we look at the definitions from United Nations Development Programs uh, 1994. And it says that human security is more than the physical security we are talking about. It's not that we are threatened and someone can kill us and so on. We talk about economic security. We talk about food security, health security, environmental security, personal security, community security, and political security. Interestingly, this idea, and this was led by Mr. Mehboob Bilhak, and this is from the research which I did, and I was very pleasantly surprised that this was initiated by our ex-finance minister. I don't know him, but I, I was very amazed to see this, that you know there is something which is written in the Wikipedia that was initiated by uh, one of our ex-economists and the finance minister. So what we're trying to see, say, do over here, already Jafri Saab and Farooq have set the scene. What are the threats? What are the problems? Why information security? What cybersecurity issues are? What is happening? But the challenge we have at the moment is that we need to understand that this is what we are talking about. So human security is this much. This is the scope of human security that we talk about community security, we talk about food security, we talk about economic security. And interestingly, everything which we are doing now, are we talking about, which is cyber secure, cyber, the medium has changed. So nothing traditional is working now. If we talk about economic security, our economic situations have changed. We're not talking of transactions of rupees or money and we should which shake hands. We're talking of the digital currency. We're talking about the digital transactions. So that means the challenge is different. Landscape has changed. Threat landscape is very different now as opposed to what it was before. We talk about the health security. Jafri Saab did mention that very briefly that there are challenges. You see that previously it was very localized. Either you know, your family knows, or your doctor knows. Even though there was no concept of privacy, uh, in, in our world, where a doctor may have 15 people in the room and they can ask about how's, how's your fever now. But, but it's still, it was very contained. It was everyone knew who is who and what he's doing and what are the problems. But the things are very different. Now we are talking of the issues, which means that we're talking of telehealth, which means that not, not only here, but your all the records, all the information, all the prescriptions, are somewhere sitting in the cloud, which you don't even know where it is. Similar thing applies political security. So just to relate these issues that these are not the you know, stories, these are realities, I was just looking at the last 24 hours, what happened in the world. Faru did mention about this, but there, these are the headlines. Can you imagine that Russia and Iran obtained US voter data uh, in a bid to sow unrest before elections, FBI. So these are the real challenges and who is involved? People are involved. We are talking, now we are not thinking from the perspective of a bank has been hacked and you know, $100 million are gone and something has happened or Bangladesh, what happened to Bangladesh bank or what happened to our one payment processor and so on. We're talking of people. Now we, we are talking of the issues which are very related to the human beings, their livelihoods, their thinking, their psychology, their health, and the issues. US government concludes Iran was behind threatening emails sent to Democrats. Russia suspected of Cold War style microwave attack on CIA agents in Australia. It is yesterday's news. So not only that we are talking about that information, data, and so on, now we have got talking of real threats that, you know, they were. The story about it is then obviously you can Google it, that these agents were uh, obviously here for a reason, with, uh, for, for business, and in their hotel rooms, there were some devices which, which made them sick. And obviously those, were, those devices were controlled remotely. 
So just think about it that, you know, what we, what is the extent of the issue? Where are we going? Hackers hold patient information for ransom in psychotherapy data breach. So just imagine that, you know, that the health is an issue from that point of view. Otherwise, if we look at it, the more usual stuff, then 200% increase in the breaches in the bank. Montreal, Metro, it's been hacked. And now you can imagine what is happening there, not really in Montreal, but in Australia, the new Metro we have, it is without driver. So you can imagine that it is all controlled by systems and not only the networking system, but the AI systems. There are sensors, they're everywhere. When the door should be closing, when the door should be opening, and when, when it leaves the platform and when it arrives and so on and so forth. So these are the things we're talking about here. If I, another aspect, I don't know whether you, you thought about this issue. Northern Beaches families bear grief at meeting over 23 suicides. This is a challenge in the Western world. We are, we are lucky. We are in an environment in Pakistan where our culture is so strong, the family support and the low support from friends is so strong that it doesn't happen. There is a problem here that young boys and girls, they just on the social media and they are on the Facebook and now they are talking and somehow they are convinced that this is time to suicide. So over a period of three weeks or four weeks, there are 23 suicides on the Northern beaches, not far from where we live. So where, what is this? This is mind changing. This is something which we need to take it extremely seriously that human psychology, human behavior, mind, this is all played by various factors and those factors, obviously, uh, we, we're going to talk about, and you know, everyone has discussed that, discussed that most of the time. And we know uh, what happened in Pakistan last year, child pornography and all of those crimes. These are all, what are the results? Can you imagine that person sitting in a remote village can be doing such things which will be impacting the world and will be the headlines of the, of the global newspapers? But this is what is happening. So we are, this is what we are heading against. Why it is all happening? I, I'm trying to be, I was, I was very conscious that I was given only 15 minutes, so I need to be very, it has to be very controlled. So what we are trying to say here, then which, we, which has been discussed by um, Farooq, as well as uh, discussed by uh, Amar Jafri Saab, that we have our landscape, which has changed. We have got global connectivity. Doesn't matter if something happens here in three seconds, it's everywhere. We have got social media, we have got modern technology. We are using AI. And not only that, we don't have any problem of any funding. Why a crime can happen? There are three things. You know that everyone, you know, being the um, background of FIA and FBI and CIA, you know that mom principle, means, opportunity, and motive. So there is no issue of all of this. There is definitely opportunity. And opportunity is the systems which are weak, the people who are unaware, and availability of bandwidth, availability of servers, and uh, what else is, and what is the um, um, motive? Motive can be anything. Motive can be financial gain. Motive can be espionage, state factor, states. We know that they are, you know, they are sponsored by, by different states as well. So we need to consider all of these things. So then nation states and state sponsored actors, there is no ethical principles. Unfortunately, all the large corporations we are talking about, we, we look at whether it's Google, whether it's um, Facebook, they talk about ethics, they talk about their policies. But in principle, if you look at it, the utilization of AI, exploitation of 
of the new, the new technology for the, against the human being, this is pretty common. I know a few young, young men and they are working in data science and they refuse to work for some of the large organizations because they don't want to be part of unethical activities because they see that how things are being treated. Can you imagine that the Facebook marketing works in a way that if there is a message which is posted of someone's funeral, his relatives will be targeted with the ads, how to settle the will, how to get the, how to exchange this information, what else you can do and so on and so forth. So, and if someone is getting married, then his friends will be getting the ads of, you know, what should be the best gift to give. Just imagine there is no limit. You can just think of things and that can be done. So it is very customized. It's very targeted. And this is all technology which can be used uh, in a way uh, which suits the large corporations or other states, but there is no ethics involved. Uh, Geoffrey Sarp did mention of dark web. Dark web is a problem. And this problem cannot be resolved by one person or one country or one defense force. It has to be collective. Something needs to be done very collectively. It has to be some legal as well as technological uh, you know, control against it. Then there, there are encryption and anonymizing technologies which make sure that you know you don't figure out you can't understand who is who and you know that's why people can get away with asking for the ransom ransoms and so on and so forth and the most importantly the speed of adoption of new technology is a lot faster than understanding the risks the example which has been given of iot by jafri sahab is perfect example that you know that there are systems which are in place in your house and forget about the system, forget about new technology, your telephones, your mobile phones. Just imagine if I say, hey Siri, it responds. I won't be surprised that it will respond even now. But it means that it is actively listening to me 24 seven. And when I say certain things, then it reacts. Otherwise they're just listening. It is not a surprise to anyone that when you go and start your car, it will tell you where you're going because of the time, because of the pattern you have, because of the understanding, you, you know, the tagging it has been done that at, at certain time you go to office, certain time you go to school and certain time you do this. So it will tell you exactly five minutes to that place or 10 minutes to that place, depending on the traffic. So we need to understand that what needs to be done. There is not always some always technological solutions, not at all. Like Farouk said, what we need to do that we definitely need to understand that why uh, that, that we need to have a combination of people, process and technology. So like, uh, I think there is nothing new in it, but these are the only ways we can, we can combat these issues that we need to global cooperation because this is a global issue. We can't work in isolation. This is not geographically located. It's not said that we, we close our borders. Australia has closed their borders for COVID. Yes, we can control COVID by not bringing anyone from outside. But if the virus is coming on the, on the internet, no border can stop it. So, that's first thing, which is extremely important. Protecting and actively defending the critical infrastructure. I think five years ago, what happened to K-Electric, which is obviously it can happen to any organization, but I do remember in Islamabad, we had a seminar and we were talking about what is critical infra infrastructure and what should be done. Unfortunately, we just talk about things which normally doesn't, nothing happens. And I had mentioned even at that time that critical infrastructure is so important that Obama has to issue an issue executive order 
no one was given a choice and it was not enough time that it passes through all the hoops. Obama had issued an executive order so that NIST can create something which can be used not only for the public uh, government sector, public sector, but also for the private sector with the cooperation. Similarly, Australia has uh, ACSC, Australian Cyber Security Center. This is a place, it is a unified, it is something which is very similar to what Canadian model is. I think probably the same model would be in UK. It could be a Commonwealth thing. And it is extremely important that we study that these models which are working already. They, are, they do offer some solutions and they do offer some advice. We have offered so many times that we can be a conduit, we can help, we can discuss, in, initiate these discussions because we work with them on a day-to-day -day basis that if anybody wants to some, want some help and arrange some dialogue. Third thing is new ways to investigate and shut down cybercrime, including dark web. I, I must say that we need to really revamp the way we are working at the moment. And uh, cybersecurity threats, cybersecurity crimes, they are at the rise, but we, the methods we have are the old methods that how to, how to fix those issues, how, how to resolve that. And sometimes uh, that, that is a serious problem. And I salute all those who work very, very hard without having any uh, or much um, infrastructure, they still do their work and try to find things. So that is a job very well done. When I compare it with the, from the, the resources we have in Pakistan, as opposed to what we have in the Western world, we don't have much, I must say that. Increase situational awareness and improve sharing of threat information with all stakeholders. Farooq had the full-fledged talk on this one. So this is the critical, this is very critical that we, we work very closely with all the stakeholders and stronger partnerships with industry. We can't work in silos. We have to, we have to work with all stakeholders. And that's what ACSC is doing. That's what kind of Canadian cybersecurity is doing. That these are, ACSC was part of Defense Signals Directorate, DSD, which has been now in, moved to ASD, which is Australian Signals Directorate, and that means they have involved the civilians. Previously, it was all defense initiative, but now the realization is that nothing will work in isolation. So have to work together. And the last thing is that clear guidance for business and consumers about securing IoT devices. IoT devices, five, uh, you know, this is basically, you can't avoid it. Technology is inevitable. So, Jo Ghalib ne kaata na, basik sabat tagayur ko zamane mein. So we have change. We will be getting change. We need to be prepared. I haven't discussed any. Obviously, um, uh, I, I understand the limitation of time, and the other uh, panelists are talking about the technology. So I, I have purposely avoided talking about those things. But my suggestion would be that we need to think globally, we need to act locally, as well as we need to work together to come up with the right solution. Happy to have any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Dr. Rizri. Any questions from the panelist or participants? A very quick question from Dr. Aftab that uh, all these uh, technology we are talking about today requires a framework, infrastructure, strategy, policy. I'm really worried that we took so many years to, now we are trying to finalize the cybersecurity policy. So what, what is your take on it that, uh, would it be on a fast track depending on the threat we are talking about or would it take the normal course what we have been doing in the past? Uh, Javis, you know already past what have we have been doing in the past. If we take the same pace, we are going in nowhere. It's a it's definitely a a, a big issue. I think that uh, uh, 
we should take the advantage of being slow in the past. And, and what advantage we can take, we see what others are doing and we adopt new standards. We adopt the standards which are already being implemented. In, in Australia, every, all public sector has been advised to have ISO 27001 certification. In addition, there are uh, these ACSC guidelines. So ACSC, what is they're doing is that they're, they've got different sectors. You know, they talk about government, they talk about the private companies, and they talk about even the families. They talk about the people, how to protect these people. What is the role of the government? Role of the government is to protect the vulnerable. And who is vulnerable? We are vulnerable. Our businesses are vulnerable. Or so what we what they need to do that they need to come up with a with a department or an organization which can help everyone because it's a common problem so we don't have to have separate arms but we need to do something jointly which is good for everyone so the models we have at the moment that there are already international standards which are being employed and it has been you know, made mandatory to be compliant to those standards. And I have used one example, ISO 27001. There are some other standards, NIST standard is there as well. There are also uh, other you know, um, best practices which are available for, the, uh, for different verticals of the, uh, of the industry. Payment card industry has very well defined standard which is called PCI DSS. PCI data security standard. And uh, more recently, as you may know that uh, I've been selected as a member of Global Executive Assessor Roundtable, which is PCI board. So we are working you know, globally to make sure that we are uh, improving the standard and addressing the threats we expect in the coming years. So why not we use all of this information to, to protect? So we need to identify our critical assets. We need to make sure that who are the key stakeholders. Long time ago in 2005, we were talking about that, you know, for telcos, PTA should be the custodian. We were talking about the financial sector, state bank should be the custodian and making sure that they are doing the right thing and they are implementing, they are, you know, advising them to implement security standards. The state bank did do something but I'm not too sure about the others, other verticals. And similarly, energy sector. Obama had said, you know, uh, that if you can't protect your energy, that forget about your future. This is what is happening to us, right? We can't do this properly with the load sheddings and all of those things. Those are different matters, but this is another mat another issue that whatever we have, we can't even secure that one. So we have to, think very seriously and uh, work on the on, on these these in these areas and take the benefit of what others have done and utilize them as much as possible thank you dad sir thank you dad thank you you're most welcome Thank you very much, Dr. Isby, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, now we will move on to our fourth speaker, uh, Mr. Gibran Elias. He's the Director of Incident Response at FireEye Mandiant and an adjunct professor at Northwest, Northwestern University. Mr. Gibran was awarded with Crane's 40 Under 40 in 2017 for his extraordinary contributions in the realm of cybersecurity. He brings over 15 years of experience in the field of information security with uh, 12 years specializing in the area of incident response, digital forensics, and threat intelligence. Uh, today, he continues to contribute to the development of policies and procedures of securing the cyberspace with an added focus on incident response and threat intelligence initiatives. Uh, today, his topic of speech will be national strategies and capacity building for the cybersecurity. A very warm welcome, Mr. Gibran. Uh, the stage is yours now. All right, so I'll, thank you so much, Rice. I appreciate it. So I will share a presentation um, that is okay. And then um, 
So I understand I have 15 minutes, but I do want to leave uh, room for some Q&A. So um, please, uh, I encourage questions um, at the end of my short um, day here. All right, so let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, are you able to see uh, the slide deck, Luis? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. it's visible. Excellent. First of all, thank you. Uh, for inviting me here. It's an honor to be speaking among uh, such esteemed uh, um, panelists and speakers here. Thank you so much. Um, so, always thank you for uh, giving a short intro. I won't take too much time uh, here on this one, um, but um, just one thing uh, that I wanted to mention um, is uh, incident response uh, that the lecture or the five, 10 minutes that I'm gonna speak it's going to be from the vantage point of incident response because that is where I spent 30 years uh, of my life. So uh, there, there will be a lot of technical uh, information in here. So if you have questions, I really welcome uh, at the end of my session to ask questions on those technical things. I really want uh, this to be, um, I want to share as much uh, as possible right from the trenches. The importance of uh, sharing uh, what I know, I, I believe, is because I get to see the incidents firsthand. Like a lot of, uh, uh, when I wasn't incident responder, I would see the incident news um, on you know these publications or news sites. I can tell you that by the time it makes um, to the news sites, it's already filtered. It's not the you know uh, the alpha information. So that is what uh, something that I want to share uh, in this brief intro. So uh, I was listening to uh, Dr. Aftar Rizwi, uh, a lot of the things uh, that I wanted to speak of on national uh, strategy um, were covered. Um, so I won't dive too deep in that because you've um, listened to some of them already. So thank you there. And, um, but I do want to highlight um, these five. Um, we really, I think the first and foremost thing, we need uh, ownership and stakeholders defined. So Dr. Aftar was talking about uh, the, you know, figure out what the assets are, define the stakeholders and go, going with that. I can't agree more. I think um, this is a very, very key point because um, without it, we're going to be all over the place. And the danger there is that nobody will have one, uh, uh, you know, the, the comprehensive uh, picture. Everybody will have a piece of it. And this is not how cybersecurity works, um, especially for a nation. You need one central command. And I think um, once we have that, things are going to be uh, easier uh, for us. So uh, number two is threat awareness. And I am going to cover this in detail just right after this slide. Um, so I think um, the, the really important thing is understanding what's, what are the capabilities. Um, like, for example, in traditional warfare, um, if people didn't know that there's um, you know, these air, air Force and they can uh, come bomb you, you wouldn't even be prepared for that, right? Uh, if you didn't know about advanced weapons, you would not be prepared for that. So just like that in cyber, you have to be fully aware of what are the capabilities and not just the capabilities, but the capabilities of uh, different kind of threat actors. Uh, there is a certain scale. Um, and I think that that's one thing that I'm gonna cover in the next slide. So. The next point, uh, because there's uh, digitization, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, for many years, um, I did, I would hear uh, in our country that, you know, our assets are safe because uh, they're not online. So that um, was, that, that won't go a long way because everybody uh, that you and me know, we all see smartphones in our hands, right? So a lot of our data is digitized already. Um, and uh, I think what we, um, like I'll give you an example. A lot of people think uh, this email and WhatsApp, they're just communication tools. That's kind of like the common belief, right? But if you think about it, um, email, especially email, is also our document repository because that's how we exchange files. And now WhatsApp even allows file exchange. Um, and there's voice notes and there's uh, data there, right? So uh, it's, these are not just communication tools. These are um, document repositories for a lot of critical data. So 
uh, we we can't we can no longer say that okay we we've got our assets uh, offline in air gap systems because there are we do talk about those things in uh, our comms channel so WhatsApp email being one of those um, and another another thing I would say about digitization and, and impact awareness I know you you folks might have heard a lot about security awareness I like to say impact awareness uh, for a reason. Um, so what do I mean by impact awareness? Security awareness is like, okay, you keep um, a strong password. You do multi-factor authentication on your Gmail or Facebook or whatever uh, other online account that you wanna secure. But if you think about it, um, you know, all these things we've been saying for at least, you know, 10, 12 years. Uh, but uh, are we really seeing uh, mass adoption? So I think one, one thing that we need to change when we, uh, as uh, cyber experts, when we're uh, talking about cyber, we don't just talking, uh, we, we don't just talk about what uh, needs to be done, but we talk about its impact to that person uh, whom we're uh, preaching to. So um, give you an interesting example. Um, um, some analogy, but I was born and raised in Karachi. So um, there would be times when uh, people will tell us, okay, ye mobile aap leke ja rahe ho, is gali mein mat jana, kyun kitchen jayega. So, apni safety phir aapko khud samaj a jati hai ke yaar, ye wala is gali mein mein ja rahe ho, ya is alakhe mein mein ja rahe ho, to phir mein ye wala mobile haath mein rakhta ho, dousra wala mein chhoat ke aata ho. So, um, so point I want to say very simple way to convey it is that because I had impact on it, so I gave my own safety in my hands and my own responsibility. So the point that I'm trying to really make here is that we, we take, um, we, we apply, uh, we make sure that our examples hit home. Because uh, if they're not uh, going to impact or if people don't understand the impact of what we're trying to preach, uh, they're not going to do it. And I think we have an advantage. Our population uh, is mostly youth and uh, they are heavily digitized. You know, you look at a four-year-old with like you know, the way they operate the iPads, even, you know, my parents can't operate at that, at that level. So I think that that is where uh, we need to um, do a really, really solid job. But it, and I will tell you, we have the advantage because we can do this better than other countries out there. So the next point, research and development. I say this because we use a lot of technology uh, from the West. Um, and uh, even that uh, threat intelligence point later on, um, and I see Farouk Nair, so he's like the master of threat and talks. So he'll uh, tell you a little bit about why threat intelligence matters. Uh, but my point is we use the products um, from the West, but we also use the intelligence, the threat intel from the West. So I think there's a need for curating local threat intelligence so that we understand what um, threat actors are after us uh, in our country um, and uh, you know th then we create our defenses according to that that uh, um, research development i know it takes time but i have seen a lot of really good initiatives in pakistan uh, there is going to be time when we will have our own platforms um, but i think we need to keep uh, encouraging that trend because um, that So from the threat awareness point of view, um, really want to share this quickly. Um, it's what we're seeing out there when we're responding to incidents uh, and the biggest incidents in the world, uh, quite frankly, uh, it's basically a who, not a what. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's a human uh, at the keyboard at the other end. You know, back in the days you would hear about, okay, this is a uh, Melissa worm or I, my SQL worm. It just comes in and it just propagates. These days, it's quite the opposite. Um, back in the days, the hackers wanted to attack for glory. They wanted to destruct and they wanted to be, you know, that's how they would gain notoriety in news that this malware destroyed this many computers. Now it's more like a slow and steady wins the race and they only target uh, specific computers that they need the data from or they need um, their communications from. So, they're very professional, well organized, and well funded. Uh, Dr. Aftab talked about both cybercrime groups and nation states, which I'm going to get to in a bit. So the sophistication is is quite high. So 
um, and they basically have a goal. And until they achieve that goal, they keep trying. So they're persistent as well. Um, go ahead, talking about persistence, if you pick them out, they will return. Um, look at it this way. So I'll give you an example. If somebody needs uh, credit card data to steal, they could go to Metro Cash and Carry, and they or they could go to Imtia's, you know, store uh, chains. Right? They will get that same data. I mean, not same similar data, but if they want credit cards, they can get credit cards from one business or or, or the other. But uh, think about this: if um, a threat actor has a goal, uh, if if they need to get uh, data from, uh, say, Boeing, um, and Boeing has really good security, they're not gonna go to Lockheed Martin and say, look, I got you this um, you know, space, the design of this aircraft. They're, um, you know, the people who task them for it, they'll say, no, 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 we asked you to get Boeing designs, not um, Lockheed Martin. So the point is that they have a goal, and until they reach their goal, they'll keep trying. So we need to really understand that, um, and especially in the context of critical infrastructure. So, because critical infrastructure, we need to have really good defense in that. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I've, I've spoken about most of this. Um, I usually merge the criminals and organized crime in a bucket, and then, um, you know, insiders, you know, the people who have access, uh, but the most uh, important kind is this uh, state-sponsored uh, threats because they're the ones who can get sophisticated at will. Uh, they have, um, you know, malware version one, version two, it depends on what kind of organization um, they're going into. And then I wanna connect this back with my earlier slide where I said that there's a human behind the keyboard at the other end. So most of the times, um, I don't know how many of you play chess, but <clears throat> when we're doing incident response, it is uh, a chess game. It's, um, you know, we, before making a move, we try to think that, okay, we try to basically think, you know, seven, eight, 10 moves in advance because we want to understand, uh, we want to anticipate what the attacker is going to do. Because if you remediate too quick, you can actually lose out visibility of the attackers in the environment. So we, we basically like to understand the, the scope and then basically predict what the attackers might do in React. So with that, uh, I'll talk about capacity building and then we'll move to Q&A. Um, so capacity building, the first and foremost, um, I, what I see um, when I visit uh, Pakistan and when I talk to people, there, there's a lot of focus on tools that, hey, I know how to use this, this tool. I've done a certified ethical hacking course. Um, I have done this bug bounty and I'm able to hack, um, or, or sometimes the questions very candidly, uh, when we talk about security, the question is, can you hack Facebook? Can you hack Gmail? So I think um, we need to uh, shift that focus to uh, teaching people fundamentals of computing rather than uh, diving right into the offense or defense for that matter. Because if you understand um, the fundamentals of computing, you can do either or. You can attack, you can defend, because you know the ins and out of those um, of the operating system. So when I say fundamentals, what I mean to say is that uh, learn Windows and Linux and Mac, you know, that should be the baseline. If you learn that technology really well, then you know that should be the base. Not like, okay, I know how to use uh, Nmap or Nessus or some other pen test tool. So, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's, that's priority number one. Number two, uh, we need to encourage innovation. Um, and I say this not for products mainly, but like uh, process as well. So Dr. Aftab talked about like people's process and technology. So technology is just one piece. Um, you know, if uh, you have an innovation on people or process part, that is also very, very good. Um, number three is very dear to my heart. Um, I really, you know, in my life, uh, and you know, I've studied until I've got a graduate degree, 
one thing that I enjoyed the most or what I remember the most out of my schooling is, you know, the, the teachers. And I know that they're good teachers, better teachers and best teachers. So what I'm trying to say here is that the teachers who are interactive, the teachers who are, um, you know, who do this with full passion, I think most teachers do, I think we really need to incentivize uh, those, those teachers because cyber is a really, really hot field right now and teachers don't get paid that well. So I think what we're dealing with is that there are not enough uh, good instructors out there to teach our young, um, you know, uh, to, uh, to our youth so that they learn the best from the best. So because the cyber industry is paying really well, everybody is moving to commercial or uh, commercial side of things. So that is my plea, my wish. Um, I wish um, something could be done uh, there. So that is very, very important, the, import the need of good instructors. Uh, number four, uh, the practical experience. So, and, and number five and four kind of go together because um, I always hear um, that um, because there, there's not a lot of incident response cases, we don't get to work on the big stuff. But if you have a mentor uh, in other country or another region, um, you can um, work pro bono on some of the cases uh, with them and you know get some real life experience. Um, there shouldn't be an excuse to not getting practical experience. I will also share this point that you know in 2020, uh, 2020 there are a lot of um, challenge uh, uh, sites like CTF sites. So if you want to do digital forensics challenges, you can go jump on that um, and you know learn there. Um, Amar, uh, you know, Sir Mar Jaffrey, he leads cyber drills for FISA. So if you ever want to get a real, real experience, you can join uh, his team and you will get to know, you know, how to cope with pressure in, in, in times like that. And you have a wonderful team who does that and they score pretty high. So you'll, you'll not only learn the cyber skill, but you will learn uh, to be a team player very, very important skill in cyber. Um, so with that, uh, I hope there are some questions because I did go very technical on the national um, capacity building and uh, national cyber strategy. So I'll turn it over for questions. Amla, can I, can I make a question to him? Yes, sure, sure. Okay, Gibran, uh, you have been coming to Pakistan in our number of events uh, for the last so many years and you, whenever you don't come even you are available to us on zoom and everything how do you feel the last say seven to eight years of journey in pakistan are we progressing well do we need to accelerate the pace of progress on a fast track or are you satisfied with the present pace of time so how honest do you want me to be <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Dead, dead honest, dead honest. Dead I honest. want the real Gibran. I want the real <laughs> Okay, so I will share this. When I, the first time I ever spoke in Pakistan was 2013 Cybersecure Pakistan. That was one of the most amazing conferences that you led um, in Pakistan. I remember it was in at the Marriott Islamabad, if I'm not mistaken. Amazing participation, amazing speakers. Um, and then uh, right after that time, you started this uh, committee of creating this uh, bill, cyber uh, bill. And if I'm not mistaken, the defense, uh, some senator, uh, Mushadul, I think, or Mushadul um, Sen, he actually uh, backed that and he took that to Senate. And that was, that's when I thought things are really, really picking up in Pakistan. But unfortunately, that bill got nowhere. Um, and I think after that, um, I saw this uh, struggling period. For the last maybe three years, uh, I have seen this pick up again. And I know there were a lot of people in this mission and you kind of kept them like a glue, but you know, some people went abroad for better opportunities. And that happens when you know, things are not happening, people are not seeing action. The um, lucky thing for Pakistan and for us is that you're there and you're persistent and you're resilient and you kept with it. So the last three years, I've seen a huge comeback. Uh, and comeback, um, not necessarily that things have actually happened. Um, I, I, I consider progress is 
is, is really, you know, very, very important. And I think you've built that momentum over the last three years that I think any time now within the next three, six, nine, and 12 months, we're going to hear some good news. That is, you know, I think it's so hard work you there's no other way to, for this to end uh, other than in success. So, as much momentum, as much as you can go forward, you can go forward. Now I see you in higher committees and, and whatnot. Um, got like a very, very strong team. There's a great ecosystem of, um, you know, cyber uh, in Pakistan now. And people are, have realized, I hope, there might be some remaining, but I, I think people have realized that if they're going to go in their silos and work, it's not going to work. I think, um, I remember, I think in 2014, you had a vision 2025. Um, in cyber secret Pakistan. And you mentioned that we all need to come together. It is 2020, and I, I already see people are coming together because they have realized that if we're going to be in our silos, it's, this is not the way cyber is going to work in Pakistan. And it doesn't work like that in anywhere. So I think um, 2025 is still five years away, but I think we're going to achieve it uh, much sooner, inshallah. And look at this conference. I mean, look, look at this uh, the participation here. Look at uh, people interested in cyber. Um, it's, it's been great. Um, I think COVID kind of actually bridged the gap because pe- before we used to rely on, okay, when are we going to talk to uh, people in um, different parts of the world to come to Pakistan? Now everything is virtual. So it's, you know, all we have to do is wake up early <laughs> to uh, be part of uh, these conferences and Farooq is here, he will attest to the same thing. So I think there's more c- uh, collaboration, more communication, more passion and huge momentum. I think uh, we under, underestimate uh, momentum. Uh, we have the momentum, but you know, the process is so much fun. If, if uh, results may be three months away, six months away, but because this process is so much fun, we're all like all in. And it's exciting times for Pakistan in cyber. Thank you, Jibran. Uh, you know, you, know uh, you reminded me of 2013 when we presented the cyber security bill in the Senate. Trust me, this is the pain I'll take with me. Trust you me. Whenever I think about it, that had they listened to us at that time, 2013, Pakistan would have been much, much, much ahead today. But I think we should not lose heart. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm very happy that now people are listening to us. And uh, we must thank all of you, especially you, uh, Farooq Nayyar, everybody who is giving us the uh, advice from the abroad. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. No worries. No worries. I mean, I think this is a big cliche sentence that, you know, in our hands, Allah has done it. کامیابی uh, Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a comment. And the comment is that persistence pays off. I've been out of Pakistan for the past 17, 18 years. I've been out of I've been out of Pakistan for the past nine years. The progress that I've seen in the past three years has been phenomenal. Phenomenal. <clears throat> And it's not just happening at the federal level. I had a, a call with the IT minister of Sindhya last night. There are some really good things happening. <clears throat> And the good thing is that whatever is happening is agnostic of politics right now. And that's the best thing. We should keep politics aside and work together in the national interest of this country. And cybersecurity is something which is a national issue of national security. So I'm really happy to see what is happening right now. And Jibran, me, and Dr. Aftar, people like me are there to help you guys out. So just let us know and we'll be there for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Farooq, you are the best source of strength for all of us. Best source of strength for all of us. Thank you, Bajit. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Amna. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gibran and Farooq Nahiya Saab. Uh, this, is, this is a very informative session. And actually, this is our concluding session. We are also in the process of uh, preparing the final recommendations. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, we, we are relying on, uh, you know, international hardwares and softwares. 
and we are unable to work on our indigenous data management. And if we talk about the cybersecurity th threats, and if we are relying on artificial intelligence, so data is the food for artificial intelligence. So how do you think we as Pakistani cope up with these challenges? My question is with Gibran Saab and his Farooq Nayyar is here. So I would like to ask the same question to him as well. Sure. Farooq, if you want to go first, better mind. Gibran Saab, you first. You oh, go first. So I had one of the things in my slides. Am I still sharing the slides? Um, I don't know. But um, one, one of the big things in my slide was this research and development uh, point. Uh, that was in my uh, point number four in national cyber strategy. I feel that is very, very important. Um, if uh, but, but it doesn't have to be from scratch. Uh, I would uh, add this. If, you know, we, you know, if you think about innovation, it's basically whatever we have available and then improving that. So I wouldn't suggest that go build something like right out of scratch. I think there is, there are some, frameworks there uh, that you can study, you can utilize and then build on top of it. So the speed is better for that. Um, you don't wanna wait you know, 20 years for, ha for having our own uh, boxes for our own appliances. I think this could be achieved much sooner, but I totally agree because we, um, there, I call data the new oil. And I think a lot of people call, call that. Oil used to have the most importance now data has. So wherever we're giving our data, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, look, this data is going to uh, machines that are out of our control or countries that are not in our control. So uh, I totally agree. I, I love the question. I think this is that research and development. Um, I, I feel we have to give a lot of importance. We have to reward our researchers um, a lot because you know, we're all in this race of like, okay, um, not, we're all basically working, um, but I think we all need to take a time out, look at the big picture, and then decide what our priorities should be in the next two years, five years, and then uh, create a game plan and just focus on it. We can't, um, you know, we can deviate, but we can't lose focus. I think that's, uh, that's what I would say. So, uh, I'll resonate uh, the comments that Gibran just made. I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel over here. Uh, I think the thing which is really important is that uh, we need to take stock or take an inventory of all the, th uh, the initiatives that are taking place in Pakistan and prioritize them as Gibran mentioned. So we need to have proper visibility of these initiatives. Secondly, we need to have proper governance and ownership. And the third thing, which Amarsab has been really stressing for is legislation. We need to have a data protection and data governance regime in Pakistan. Data is, is exactly, uh, to your Gibran's point, is the new oil. I met uh, the Facebook leadership in Pakistan uh, last year and people from Google also. And they were all talking about the fact that given the fact that there's no data protection or data management regime in Pakistan, there's lots of ad hocism. So we need to make sure that we have proper visibility, proper governance, proper oversight on that, and all the stakeholders realize as to what is at stake over here right now. So I think uh, we need to start from, and Gibran made a really good point, we don't, have to, we don't have to start from scratch. We need to uh, replicate uh, ideas, things which are already tried and tested uh, in uh, economies which are progressing well. I mean, we can look at the example of Far Eastern countries like Singapore, Malaysia, uh, who, are, who are doing really good in the area of data management and regulation. We can learn a lot from um, European Union and the Western worlds. So just learning from those things, uh, you, learning from those uh, use cases, uh, I think would be a good start. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, so uh, moving on towards our final speaker of the day, it's uh, Dr. Jiang Tianjiu. He's an assistant professor at the Fudan Development Institute, China. His research focuses on cybersecurity, non-proliferation, and strategic stability between China and the US. Dr. Jiang will work as assistant researcher at Center for Global Cyberspace Governance Studies, Fudan University. He delivered presentations at various institutions, including the International Student, Young for Gosh, 
Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, the Wilson Center's Asia Pacific Nuclear History Institute, and Cyberspace Administration of China. Uh, Dr. Jiang earned his doctorate from Fudan University, where he specialized in the armed control and regional security. Uh, today, he will be talking about China's strategic thinking on cyber offense and defense. So uh, the forum is yours now, Dr. Jiang. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, Center for Pakistan and Internal Relations invitation. This is also my first time to attend uh, your event. And uh, uh, in fact, it's already midnight in China, so uh, please forgive me if I fall asleep suddenly. And uh, well, my topic is from offense dominance to defense and deterrence. I'm going to talk about the shift of China's strategic thinking on cyber war. Because my, uh, this is, in fact, uh, I published the paper uh, last year uh, uh, by the World Scientific uh, Publishing House. So in fact, you can refer to the paper on the internet. And I'm going to talk about um, the large scale cyber attack. It might be different from the uh, hacking or cyber espionage issues. I will focus on those uh, large scale cyber attack against like critical infrastructures and also uh, used as the uh, geopolitical gaming between uh, uh, major cyber powers. So um, in fact, uh, the literature review on US-China cyber war, it shows that uh, um, the, most of Western literature believe that uh, because uh, uh, China, it, it is very likely for China to launch large scale cyber attack against the US and also other maybe uh, Western uh, countries and uh, China is believed to have made uh, long-term preparations uh, for cyber war against the U.S. according to the uh, official documents uh, from the U.S. Congress. And excuse me. And in fact, there are two groups of people contributing to the so-called the China cyber war threat. Uh, the pessimists about the revolution of cyber technology and cyber war in general, and also scholars studying US-China relations, especially those uh, study the Chinese military, the PLA. And for the pessimistic argument in general, they believe that the revolution of cyber technology has fundamentally impacted the world military balance and international relations because uh, the attribution problem and third party responsibilities, so it will be very hard to identify and retaliate cy large scale cyber attack. And also the defender has to maintain a great for, for the entire system why the attacker only needs to find a single weak point. So the offense, uh, defense balance, it, it is imbalanced. And that also the low entry barrier and the rapid proliferation of cyber weapons and multiples the power of the small and weak actors. Well, and the, the pessimistic argument on the US-China relations, uh, I, I think it, it is more and more obvious in recent years that uh, the tensions raised between these two countries and uh, President Trump also regarded China as the strategic competitor. So it, it seems that this kind of uh, the uh, Wars bilateral relations coincide uh, coincide with the pessimistic argument on the revolution of cyber technology, and such kind of argument believe that China is uh, prepared for uh, launching large scale cyber attack against the U.S. However, we do have some counter argument against this kind of uh, uh, technological uh, I call it technological determinism. Because, in fact, there are many reasons why a state has to restrain a cyber operations or so-called large-scale cyber attack, because most cyber weapons are one-time use. And they, as long as you use the cyber attack, then it will no longer be the adversary's weak points. And the cyber attack is also helping the rival to discover their system of vulnerabilities, which means that the more frequent cyber attack, the stronger defense it needs to challenge. And the malware can be reproduced to target the original attacker very quickly. 
So uh, it will also cause a serious like collateral damage to third party and also blow back to the initiator itself. And the damage caused by the cyber attack against a robust system with good resilience and the backup is usually temporary. So it will not change the fundamental balance of power between rivals. So um, how China's uh, strategic thinking on cyber war? Uh, according to my research, I think uh, there is a shift of this kind of strategic thinking. So uh, in the early stage of the, the PLA, Chinese military uh, informationization, uh, Chinese strategists, uh, they do overemphasize the cyber offense and the effectiveness of the cyber attack as a coercive tool. And, uh, but in fact, uh, I think most of the current Western literature, they uh, ignore the fact that in the uh, later around maybe 2010 and even in recent years, in fact, there have been more and more debate on the so-called cyber offense, defense and deterrence strategy. And uh, in fact, uh, especially since 2015, 2016, I think that the China's strategic thinking on cyber war has returned to uh, defense and deterrence. So I'm going to explain in detail. Uh, the offense dominance period, uh, I, I think uh, is mainly uh, from 1990s to early 2000. Most current uh, English literature, they argue that the cyber warfare is appealing to China, not only in regional conflicts like uh, Taiwan Strait, but also in peacetime, uh, uh, as it is uh, accordance with Chinese uh, so-called classic thinking on warfare. Uh, one of our colleagues just mentioned the art of war. And uh, so in the it, uh, it is true that in the early stage of China's catching up with informationization, uh, the PLA emphasized the cyber offense and the preemptive strikes, and even characterized the major cyber attack as a coercive tool against the US. I have illustrated uh, many, uh, you can refer to the, the, the PLA's textbook. They do uh, have this kind of like principles and uh, 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 cases uh, for, their students. Um, however, as I just mentioned that I think uh, the most current Western literature, they only focus on the early stage of the PLA's thinking and that they, so, which, which means that their current views is largely biased one. I think they ignored the fact that uh, there has been uh, many debate on offense and defense and deterrence uh, since around 2010. And because uh, in fact, uh, after uh, 2008 and 2009, there have been more and more uh, like civilian researchers joining the debate on cyber war. So not only the PA strategists pay attention to that, but also uh, many civilian researchers. And also because uh, China has uh, become more and more integrated to the international market. So uh, it cannot uh, bear uh, the cost of like uh, launching a large scale cyber attack and uh, its uh, potential uh, collateral damage to its own economic development and also its access to international market and, and the internet. So the year, uh, I think 2008 is a, a, is a key point and uh, at 2008, we have also witnessed there have been many uh, serious like cyber war or cyber uh, accidents across the world, like the Stuxnet, Arab Spring, and also uh, other uh, important cases, and uh, also even cyber conflicts across the world. So uh, not only the PLA strategists pay attention to that, but also other scholars from uh, diplomatic areas, from economic areas, all of these scholars, they joined the, the debate. And uh, in fact, I have also illustrated several uh, uh, arguments here. Um, most of the civilian scholars, they believe that in fact, uh, the cyber attack might not be that effective, uh, as effective as uh, those PLA strategies argued in the early stage. So in fact, this time of uh, the debate is a kind of like reflection on the early stages uh, cyber 
uh, uh, the principle on the cyber warfare thinkings. And also, um, even the PLA officers during this period, uh, I argued here, uh, they believe that the cyber attacks usually cause like uh, no damage to physical assets or personnel casualties, which means that uh, the result of cyber attack are temporary and reversible. Where in the, so the credibility of cyber retaliations become very low. So since the effectiveness of cyber attack is largely uncertain and usually limited, maybe due to the enemy's superior defense, or even negative due to the collateral damage and blowback, so it further weakens the rationale for offense dominance and coercion by cyber attack. So um, finally, this is the, the third stage, I think, back to defense and deterrence post-2015. Uh, uh, since the cyber deterrence uh, has been confirmed as the key part of the U.S. national uh, cybersecurity strategy, um, both ch Chinese military and non-military strategies believe that it is time to develop their own cyber uh, defense and deterrence strategy. So um, I also have um, many <coughs> literature and uh, uh, illustrate a lot of uh, viewpoints here. And uh, as you can, you can see, for example, like a colonel from the PR Academy of Military Science, they agree with uh, these arguments and uh, analyze how to establish China's uh, cyber de deterrence in details. For example, it says it is essential to declassify the tests for some cyber weapons and demonstrate the PLA cyber equipment and even broadcast the cyber trail in order to increase the credibility of cyber deterrence. And there is a balance between hiding and brandishing the cyber capabilities, which can perplex the enemy and dissuade the potential attackers. So these points, and they are not only the debate uh, among like uh, PLA or the non-PLA strategies, they have largely been reflected in official documents recently published by the government. For example, the Chinese military strategy in 2015 introduced how the PLA will protect cybersecurity without using the word deterrence, but it, it also mentioned the concept between like the cyber defense and the deterrence strategy. And one year later, the Chinese national cyberspace security strategy criticized the, uh, the cyber deterrence for first. However, in the section on uh, strategic tasks, it states clearly that China will simultaneously develop protection, uh, protection and deterrence and focus on identification, prevention, monitoring, early warning, and response handling, and other such segments. But furthermore, it will adopt all measures, including economic, administrative, scientific, technological, legal, diplomatic, and military measures to protect its information infrastructure and informational, uh, information resources. And the latest Chinese international strategy of cooperation on cyberspace follows the same pattern by criticizing the deterrence buildup in cyberspace at the beginning while proposing to expedite the development of a cyber force and enhance capabilities to prevent a major cyber crisis. But although the, an official Chinese cyber defense and deterrence strategy has yet to be established, reading between the lines reveals that these strategic thinking can be found in all of the current relative materials. And uh, so finally, I also illustrated several uh, sources uh, and literatures for your review. If, uh, of course, most of the resources are in Chinese. Um, I translated uh, their uh, the, 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 uh, titles and also authors and their uh, authors uh, affiliations and uh, the sources. Uh, if you are interested in, in fact, uh, there's an open database for, for, for reference. Um, so uh, last but not least, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me through email and uh, the paper uh, is on the website. So you can just uh, re refer to the paper. Um, I'm, I'm sorry because it's, uh, it's very late in China now, so maybe I skipped uh, some important parts during my presentation. I think I can leave more time for Q&A sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jiang, for joining us uh, this week.
Uh, if anyone from the panelists have question, Ambassador Khalid. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sir. See, first, uh, I just want to make a caveat that uh, I lost my internet connection uh, for quite some time. So, what I say, maybe sometime it may appear repetitive. So, please excuse me. Uh, uh, this webinar has uh, uh, really uh, encompassed uh, a lot of information about uh, this cyber warfare. Uh, it's full of content uh, and substance. And I'm really grateful to all the speakers who made it possible. And above all, uh, uh, credit must go to for it for to Kopiar and its uh, president uh, Amna Malik. Uh, you, do you want me to say something or ask just a question? Uh, depending upon the time availability. Yeah, I just wanted you to. If you have any question, you can ask from Dr. Jing. Also, you if you have any comment, please go ahead because we yeah, are in so, the process of. Okay, so, so we all know how the, uh, you know, the world has moved from uh, electronic to the computer age, and uh, we now face a new set of uh, uh, problems as well as uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, threat of the, you know, the cyber warfare, uh, it touches uh, or it involves states, non-state actors, uh, ideological people uh, imbued with extremism, uh, organized crime, uh, individual criminals. Uh, so all this thing has really uh, made this subject of uh, very uh, immediate uh, uh, importance. Uh, from what I heard, uh, it uh, will also imbibe that uh, uh, the threat is uh, uh, both uh, internal, external, and uh, what we need to adopt a very holistic uh, approach uh, to uh, meet this uh, new challenge. So many suggestions have been made, uh, uh, you know, how to uh, uh, you know, meet this challenge. Uh, they're all very valid and important proposals. Uh, but one thing I just want to emphasize, uh, which is uh, a minor point, but I think of uh, still great uh, significance and great impact. And that is that uh, all the hardware, uh, which we uh, import, uh, it is from the developed countries, you know. And uh, there is a uh, possibility and very patent danger of uh, you know, inbuilt malware. Uh, that uh, what you are using, it's already has in it uh, such uh, mechanisms that uh, this can be at any time disrupted or uh, surveillance can take place. So what's important is that while we are undertaking all the other measures, we should try to build up our capacity to not only manufacture our own hardware, but also to uh, devise our own softwares. Uh, we have done some good work, of course, but uh, much more needs to be done, and we remain dependent on the, ex the countries from which we import these things. Uh, so there is always a danger of uh, uh, our system being disrupted. So this was my point. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, Ambassador Khalid, for your comment. Uh, now we will move on towards the last and most significant part of our today's session. 
Ms. Amna Malik, the President of Center of Pakistan and International Relations, uh, will share her recommendations in the cybersecurity. Uh, Ms. Amna Malik uh, is, apart from being the President of the Center of Pakistan and International Relations, she is the founder of several initiatives and she is leading her think tank on the re research and publications uh, focusing on emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, data analytics, and their implications on the national security. Uh, she is the staunch advocate of policies related to the adoption of emerging technologies in the realm of national security. Uh, she has been awarded from the President of Pakistan, Dr. Arif Alvi, and the former Prime Minister of uh, Malaysia, Mr. Mahathir Mohammed, for her extraordinary efforts and contributions for the Pakistan. So, uh, Ms. Amna, your speech, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the worthy speakers uh, who participated today, and it's a very informative session for us. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about our efforts regarding emerging technology implications in national security policy. We have been working and our research and development team of Center of Pakistan and International Relations is working for many months uh, to develop a comprehensive report on uh, emerging technology implications in national security policy. And uh, this side, our Center of Cybersecurity is working day and night uh, to prepare certain re recommendation, which inshallah we will publish soon, and we will share uh, with all our worthy speakers. Uh, I'm also thankful to our senior advisors, uh, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood Saab and Amar Jafri Saab, who always supported us, especially in our this uh, efforts uh, efforts. And I am also thankful uh, to all our worthy speakers who were, who were here, like Farooq Saab, uh, uh, Professor Jang, and uh, 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 Dr. Aftaf Saab. Uh, we, we are trying to advocate uh, through it our seminars, through our webinars, through our research publication, that how important, uh, and, but, and this is the right time to work on these emerging technologies. In, in our previous webinars, we just had a, a, an, another international webinar on 17th of October, and we identified uh, certain uh, important cybersecurity breaches, threats, policy gaps, and challenges, and way forward. That how uh, we are facing those difficulties and how we need to address those challenges. As we all know, and it is mentioned by Amar Jafri Saab as well, that we are living in the times of fourth industrial revolution of knowledge, information, and technology. Therefore, cybersecurity should be an integral part of our security strategy. So purpose of this webinar is to ensure a secure and re resilient cyber space with the aim to protect information and developing mechanism for cybersecurity and doing the policy advocacy. So today I would like to uh, present certain recommendations. My first recommendation is, uh, Wes, can you move to the next slide, please? Thanks to you and Khalid Saab, Amar Saab, you always support us. No, 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 mashallah. Actually, uh, right now the need for such, uh, actually uh, we need to raise the issues and then without any politics, this is very important, without any politics, should talk about it. He is not the Sorry. national cause. This is something which is very yeah. important to talk about. And, and, and I'm not, this is going to affect everybody. Everybody. It's not going to affect one person, one organization. It's going to affect everybody. So we have to all, above politics, above party, above where we are sitting, we need to talk about the future of Pakistan. That's very important. Whether Actually, it's, the, the, it's not only affecting the governors and the military. It is also affecting the individuals. Even mm -hmm. uh, during our research work, we realized that mostly the SMEs are uh, the ones who are uh, mostly the factors of cyber threats. Exactly. And they are facing challenges and then they don't have the financial resources to address those challenges. So uh, I discussed earlier. Uh, can you move to next slide, Uves? So our vision is to build a cyber secure and resilient Pakistan. Next. So now I move to the recommendations part. So my first recommendation is national security policy 
and cyber security policy. Effective implementation of national cyber security policy and formulation of effective national defense, security, and de deterrence strategy is the need of an hour. This enables a vibrant cyber security ecosystem, formulating a comprehensive legal and regulatory framework. So we believe that regulation of Pakistan cyber space is something very important. And also, which what is mentioned earlier by one of our worthy sp speaker, that regulating IoT devices is also something very important. Then we also need to enhance the capacity building of law enforcement agency, and government needs to sponsor the uh, research and development in this regard. So the first thing at the national level is very important that we should have a comprehensive national cyber security policy. We talked about the automated weapons, we talk about uh, AI implications in uh, defense, but if we are unable to cater uh, the cyber security challenge, so first of all, we need to make an effective national cyber security policy and we need to work on the strategies, uh, uh, all the uh, intelligentsia policy makers need to sit together. And I think may, uh, a lot of work has already been done. We just need to move little bit further. Then the second point is, can you move to the next slide, Wes, please? The second imp most important thing is that establishment of National Cyber Command Center. Uh, we need a robust National Cyber Incident Response Center with world-class capabilities to respond to all types of cyber incidents Early warning system is an example of it. Then cyber drills uh, is also something which is very imp important. Uh, so we can see that uh, in this hybrid warfare uh, uh, times, we need to work on uh, a central command system. Uh, we also discussed about the e-council in which all the important stakeholders should be the part in it. And if there is a cyber threat, so there should be some mechanism of early warning in it. Next point, something which is very important, global collaborations on cyber uh, information, on cyber security uh, drills, and also we need to share information and knowledge. We, we have gone through a number of uh, conferences, international conferences. We, we did a lot of research on how the US uh, work on cyber security, what did China do? And uh, I think Pakistan also need to further collaborate and have a joint uh, cy cyber exercise. I appreciate Amar Jafri Saab. He initiated certain uh, cyber drills in Pakistan with the collaboration of other international organizations. I think such kind of activities are really need of time. Also, there should be a student exchange program and uh, other kind of collaboration like the think tanks collaborate with other international think tanks, the military organizations and the policy advocates also interact with other international organizations so that we, we try to make Pakistan a robust cybersecurity nation. Next point. So our last point is impact awareness and public awareness campaigns that is something very important uh, we need to engage the private sector if we really want to uh, further improve ourselves uh, center of pakistan and international relations uh, try try to train uh, cyber scouts and uh, we also collaborated with the cit institute which work on cyber security trainings especially encouraging the university student to consider it also an opportunity to work in this field. And I think the government also need to patronize and give scholarships to the students and also need to work on the research and development. We mentioned about the reliance on indigenous technology. So that is on, on, only possible that if we have our own uh, research development labs uh, on cybersecurity in Pakistan, already there, there, there are certain development by HEC. Uh, they develop a center of cybersecurity, but, but we need to have some more uh, initiatives like this. 
the complete recommendations and the complete report will be published inshallah after the event and now i would like to request amar jafri saab to conclude our, and if you want to add any recommendation and i would like to thank you all of you um unmute kindly uh, unmute okay, okay 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 ja jafri okay. saab kindly uh, unmute ji ji kai thank you uh, so um, amna i really thank you for all you have done today it's for marvelous let me tell you very fine you know the high quality discussions and uh, i would just like to add uh, two three more sessions to it i think one is uh, we should implement common criteria in pakistan let me briefly explain the common criteria common criteria is international standard and pakistan is signatory to it anything which is linked to internet when you bring it to the country there is a criteria that it should pass through that criteria and interestingly the country which uh, which is of the responsible for the asia pacific is malaysia and they have approached me a number of times that you should start it so i would request you to please work on it common criteria and uh, once we uh, have this common criteria in pakistan then we can have certain certification we'll talk about it in detail second point is uh, observing the threat vector in pakistan i would suggest to invest in open source open source apparently apparently looks at a very difficult activity but there are few organizations they are working on that and i think we should talk to them that we should have some open source uh, software solutions in cyber security because in open source there is advantage that you can customize this tailored as per your own requirement although it is also dangerous because at time open source have some uh, some sort of uh, zero gaps into it and then people enter into it but again it is a, it is a trade off if you import something because as i said in the beginning advanced countries have made all these things for their benefit for their uh, business promotion all these things nobody knows which is which is which thing is coming from where we see the label made of fly don't know from where it is made from so there were few, and the last recommendation would be uh, we should bring in place an ecosystem in which everybody i repeat again i think i am repeating this sentence for last 10 days on every forum everybody should be on board and work together we may have personal differences we have we may have organization differences we have some business interest but nothing is above pakistan i thank you amna again for arranging all these things thank you very much our one friend thank you amar so we have yeah uh thank you very much uh, our worthy speaker mr george sebastio is with us uh i would uh, like to introduce him first uh, he is an internationally renowned information communication technology speaker in the subject of cyber security blockchain ai iot and big data over his 30 years of ict experience he contributed significantly in the realm of cyber safety and security in different domains he has been the speaker at numerous international conferences with the topics including the ics security ict security business continuity ict architecture wireless security and cyber security today he will talk about ai implications on the cyber security so uh, mr george a very warm welcome you can start now uh sure uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, first i apologize for being in a noisy environment uh, also with uh, lack of internet since i'm on the road so but i did manage to get at least a uh, wireless connection that is decent enough i hope that there is not too much noise while i will do my, my discussion uh first uh, ai actually has very serious implement implications for cybersecurity uh, both on the attack side as well as on the defense side uh for many reasons because uh, in today's uh, information driven world data is the key element uh for Uh, decision making as far back as uh, about 10 years ago i introduced an approach towards uh, cyber security what i call a cyber security framework known as the a6 of cyber security so each a represents a key element of cyber security the first a is for assess uh, the second a is for architect uh, the third a uh, is for apply which is implement uh, the fourth a is for administer uh the fifth a is for awareness and the sixth a is for 
agility. Now, AI, uh, there's not a need or is not required in all the elements, but certainly is required in some elements of the, the assess part. AI can play an extremely important element in compiling the data that is driven uh, within the assessment of the risk factors that are associated with cybersecurity. AI does not have to play a role in either architect or apply, although you may design AI elements into the architecture. So we are not really using AI at this stage yet to architect the cybersecurity system, but certainly that may come later in the future as AI matures further. However, AI uh, plays an extremely important role in the administer part, which is what you do in cybersecurity on a day-to-day -day basis. It plays an important role in the awareness component to give you positioning of the risk factors. And it definitely it plays an important role in the awareness uh, as well as agility. So how to respond uh, quicker to a cyber attack. Uh, if we go back quite a number of years, we realized that the problem why AI became important in the defense side is the fact that, for example, the number of viruses that were being created on a daily basis was simply too many, and the signatures were not, not able to keep up. So that really means even if you were going to update your signatures every five minutes, every uh, 10 minutes, what would really happen is that you would not have a proper response to the new viruses being created. So that really means AI could start playing an important role and helping you understand the attacks uh, that the antivirus signatures uh, were not able to, to respond to. So that means you're starting to do aspects associated with behavior response. Now, if you are, Antivirus obviously started by being in the endpoint part of the security, but eventually we moved it to gateway uh, email or internet access gateway. That really means that products like, for example, Cibari, which eventually got bought by Microsoft um, almost uh, seven years or so ago, played an extremely important role in which the inference between four or up to eight antivirus engines was compiled together to determine the risk factor associated with data being sent in across the gateway or an email system or otherwise. The second area in the defense where AI plays an extremely important role is in the SOC or Security Operation Center. Initial versions of SOC, what we sometimes call SOC 1.0, SOC 2.0, and now SOC 3.0, up uh, Initial versions of SOC were simply based on uh, SIM uh, technology, so simple incident management and response associated. Very similar to the issues that we had in the antivirus are being found in the SOC uh, response issues. That really means we are compiling now attack data coming from so many sources, but not being able to determine what is the important data to respond to or whether it's really an attack taking place based on the information that is being compiled by the correlation engine on the SOC. So you can say that the AI engine that we introduced in the modern version 3.0 SOC play an extremely important role and create kind of a autopilot or co-pilot that complement the existing correlation rules that already exist. Beyond that, uh, the AI can now also start playing an important role even in training and awareness. As you know, we need to start compiling uh, the training skills and profiles both at the end user level as well as administration level. So that really means that AI can help us decide what is the training um, that is more effective and produces the best results and what are the areas that need to be addressed uh, to have a complete uh, uh, solution in the environment. All the areas where AI has an extremely important element is in the area also of threat uh, management, which plays an important role in how we model uh, the modern cyber attacks as, as they take place. So far, I have mentioned that AI plays an important role 
in the area of cyber defense. And in what AI is actually doing is helping you understand uh, the data that is not clear to the average cybersecurity person because there's simply too much data to handle. So many have used data analytics or data scientists in the past, but even this is not enough. So AI with machine learning goes beyond big data to create a complete incidence response system that is much more effective in a modern uh, SOC uh, 3.0. This is on the cyber defense side. On the cyber attack side, uh, AI is playing an extremely important role as well by helping you uh, create uh, better attack models uh, that were simple, uh, not possible before, and are driven uh, by uh, data. Uh, several examples of this, including being able to impersonate somebody's voice. Today with AI, uh, if you record the biometric voice of a person, you can, uh, with as little as 30 seconds or even less of that voice, you'll be able to replay that voice or the biometric voice of that person. So it means you'll be able to impersonate that verse person. So it means in a cyber attack scenario, by being able to create more modern cyber attack uh, vectors, this plays an important uh, role. In the last uh, three plus years, we have seen the birth of a new technology uh, that is uh, infecting a lot of our social media that we sometimes refer to as deep fakes. So deep fakes, again, is a, an area of uh, deception in which we can generate data that appears to be real, but this time it's not just voice data, it's actually complete end-to-end -end video data. So we can replace uh, statements that have been said by key individuals and completely destabilize a situation at the country level uh, in the position by distributing it on social media. We can affect the impact uh, of elections or even other important course um, uh, of uh, action. Now, there is a new technologies, of course, that have been also been introduced in which uh, it helps us detect impersonation at the voice level as well as impersonation of deep fakes in video. However, this technology still uh, needs substantially to mature as we are still in the early days of being able to achieve this in a very uh, effective way. As uh, we move forward, um, I do believe that AI uh, plays an extremely key role in the area of cybersecurity, what it happens to be on the attack side and creating new, more modern cyber weapons, or in the defense side, in which it helps us defend against these attacks in a much more innovative way by being able to address information that we do not recognize as being potentially dangerous in our environment. I do believe as well that uh, AI by itself is not going to be sufficient as the tool. It's simply one of the various tools that will be available against the modern uh, cybersecurity scientists as they defend the modern IT infrastructure of things like, for example, smart cities or critical infrastructure in a country or even at the cyber warfare uh, level as well. So. Other technologies that I see playing an extremely important role beyond AI, uh, they'll include uh, technologies like, for example, fuzzing, which helps us to populate and identify risk areas that privately were not previously identified as potential risk against uh, specific objects, um, like uh, inf critical infrastructure objects. Uh, technologies like, for example, uh, blockchain, which helps us add extra elements of trust uh, that simply were not possible before. And this is elements of trust without a central authority. Other technologies that I see extremely playing a important role as well as AI is technologies like quantum computing. And the same area here applies as I talked about AI. Uh, both AI as quantum computing uh, can be used both on the defense side as well as on the cyber attack side. Side. On the cyber defense side, uh, quantum technologies can help us create quantum encryption, which creates a one-time bad scenario, almost making uncryptable or unbreakable cryptology.
on the cyber attack side, uh, quantum computing will allow us to break keys much faster than it was simply possible uh, before. Uh, this is uh, my short uh, presentation for you today uh, with the implications of uh, AI in the area of cybersecurity, both in the cyber defense as well as in the cyber attack uh, side as well. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be uh, with you today uh, as part of the co-pair and as part of uh, the esteemed guests that are here like Amar, Jeffrey, and many others in which we have participated uh, in many events in the past as well. Looking forward for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, your experience can be really good for our mm -hmm. students, especially for our centers uh, of artificial intelligence and uh, cybersecurity centers. Because we are talking about the technologies which can really help us to develop and work on further uh, artificial intelligence solutions and cybersecurity solutions. So uh, what you recommend for Pakistan, because you have been visiting many times to Pakistan, uh, what are your recommendations? Because we just concluded the policy recommendations for national security policy on cybersecurity. I just want your comment that what do you think that Pakistan needs to implement? What should be the certain points? So that well, we become I, I a cyber resilient uh, nation. Correct. Okay, there's two or three areas that I think is extremely important. The first one is the education side. So to introduce more artificial intelligence knowledge, especially in machine learning and other elements of artificial intelligence into the curric curriculums. Basically what we call set the secure education training and awareness uh, program. Um, beyond that, I think the most important part of any cyber uh, security effectiveness is the concept of uh, agility. And the only way you can achieve agility is by introducing uh, red and blue teams uh, and create basically what we call or refer in the industry as cyber drills. So only uh, once you have conducted enough uh, scenarios of cyber drills, will you actually know if the teams that you have created are responding um, effectively. So you can have cyber drills between red and blue teams, or you can have events like what we sometimes refer to as capture the flag events, in which you create scenarios uh, like, for example, a smart city scenario or other, in which several teams compete against each other, both on the defense as well as on the attack side to see the ones on the attack if they can penetrate the like, points that have to be defended, or on the defense side to be able to identify that the attack is actually taking place and try to either slow it down or being able to, to stop the attack. I do believe that the practical aspects of cyber drills are, are complementary to education. So only when you put the cyber scenarios in action or in a practical scenario, you will know if they are inf effective in the real world, not in the theoretical world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wes, do you have any question or any other? Uh, uh, any? No, ma'am. Just a comment that, as Mr. George said, that uh, AI and other nascent technologies, they uh, also pose a great challenge and great risk for us, but they also provide great, greater opportunities. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, you know, conclude the session and move towards the ending as Ms. Amna Malik, the president of Center of Pakistan International Relations, uh, provided her recommendations for the national level uh, policy making on the cybersecurity of Pakistan. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude and extend my vote of thanks to Mr. George and all the other speakers, including Mr. Jaffrey, uh, Mr. Jibran Elias, Dr. Rizvi, and Mr. Farooq. Uh, 
the recordings of this, uh, these sessions will be uploaded on the uh, YouTube and Facebook handles of the Copier, and a post-event report will be published and circulated among the, all the stakeholders, including the think tanks, the policymakers, academia, and defense institutions. And with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude the session. I will say that be cyber aware and spread cyber awareness in your social circles. And uh, we'll meet you, inshallah, with another initiative another, in another webinar. Uh, till then, thank you very much, and God bless you. Pakistan's in the power.